And here in New York City, I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad Smith. This is Yahoo Finance's flagship show, The Morning Brief, the ultimate guide to help investors make smarter decisions for their portfolio. We're tracking early session volume while bringing you today's top market themes and elevating Yahoo Finance's most popular newsletter. That's right. We've got an action-packed show for you today. Big tech dragging down futures with earnings from Microsoft, Alphabet, and AMD failing to live up to the hype. Is this the start of a steeper sell-off? And investors awaiting comments from Fed Chair Jay Powell this afternoon as the latest reading on private payrolls showing that U.S. companies add fewer than expected jobs in January. As it stands right now, traders are still split on the timing of that first rate cut, although it has come up a bit right now, standing around 50 percent at the next meeting in March. So let's get right to it with the three things that you need to know your roadmap for the trading day. Yahoo Finance's Josh Lipton, Ines Ferre, and Jennifer Schaumberger have more. That's right. The not-so-magnificent seven Alphabet shares falling this morning. It's after missing analyst expectations on ad revenue, the heart of the tech giant's business. And Microsoft shares flat in pre-market trading as the tech giants struggle to meet the street's expectations for AI. Investors hoping for stronger results from its peers, Apple, Amazon, and Meta, who are all set to report after the bell on Thursday. And shares of Boeing ticking higher this morning. This is after the company beat the street's fourth quarter expectations. The plane manufacturer is suspending its 2024 guidance amid fallout over the incident with one of its Alaska Airlines 737-9 MAX jets suffering a blowout from its a plug for, from its door earlier this month. And all eyes on the Federal Reserve this afternoon for its interest rate decision. The central bank is widely expected to hold its benchmark interest rate steady in the range of five and a quarter to five and a half percent for the fourth meeting in a row. But investors will be listening closely for any clues on when the Fed could begin cutting. Well, big tech feeling the weight of lofty expectations for artificial intelligence. Alphabet's ad revenue came up short of the street's expectations and AMD's weak sales forecast putting pressure on shares. So to sum it up, expectations for AI were, well, too high here. And particularly here as we're taking a look at the Google ad revenue and then additionally on the right side of your screen, you've got the AMD revenue forecast here as well. These are the two big areas that investors saw some of their expectations missed on in that most recent earnings period for these two companies. Yeah, Brad, and I think a lot of that, at least the share reaction in the price of these stocks here this morning ahead of the open has to do with those AI numbers and exactly what we heard. It wasn't a bad quarter really for any of those companies across the board when it comes to AI investments. Like you just said, Google's big issue here in the most recent quarter was ad spending and what they are seeing there and in their core business, some softness that has the street concerned. But when it comes to Microsoft, their Azure growth was just around 30%. But that AI factor, it might be masking maybe some of the weakness that is, uh, I guess, still very much there in some of the uh, the Azure base, the core base business there for the company. We know that the strength of generative AI driving 6% of Azure's growth here in the quarter. So outside of that, that is causing a bit of concern here for investors. But remember, these are stocks that have had massive run-ups over the last year, massive run-ups going into this report. The expectations were extremely high. So if we didn't see a massive beat here, across the board, even though we did get better than expected expectations here from Microsoft. It simply was not enough here for the street, and we're almost seeing a sell the news type of event. Yeah, absolutely. Essentially, they kicked off the call for Google, talking about four areas that they really wanted to focus in on. One of them was search, subscriptions as well, and then $15 billion in annual revenue for YouTube as well here, five times there since 2019. And here's a little bit more color from Alphabet CFO Ruth Porat, providing some insights into the tech giant's spending plans. Take a listen. The step up in CapEx in Q4 reflects our outlook for the extraordinary applications of AI to deliver for users, advertisers, developers, cloud enterprise customers, and governments globally, and the long-term growth opportunities that offers. 
And so all of this considered here, the long-term growth opportunity means upfront spending as of right now. That's how Sundar really kicked off the call, talking about those investments in AI and how they were going to spend a lot more time talking about where the core user could expect this to actually show up in their experience, whether they're at the end of the day using uh, some type of Google search feature uh, or where that's playing into Lens or even where we're ultimately going to see that have a role in some of the workspace features. And that is more of the cloud focus for Alphabet that they're thinking about going forward and where those investments could play out. Yeah, certainly when you take a look at these numbers, it's safe to say, at least from the street's perspective, they don't see enough progress on generative AI and what it's doing to support Alphabet's core business and exactly what that looks like going forward to further incorporating the AI technology into their products, into other parts of their business. And they're all they're also still largely seen as playing catch up to Microsoft. Microsoft very much at least viewed in many investors' minds as a leader when it comes to AI, given the investment that they had early on in open AI and what they have done in order to integrate AI into their core products already. We're seeing that in Microsoft results. So it really just shows the pressure that is on so many of these other companies to really prove that their investments in AI are already paying off. Well, we've summoned Microsoft into the chat. Let's stay there for a second here. Microsoft shares pre-market as of right now, as we're tracking it. They are flat, but just barely to the downside by about four or five tenths of a percent. Tech giants struggled to meet the street's high expectations for AI in its second quarter. Microsoft reported strong growth in cloud driven by high demand for AI services, but its softer than anticipated guidance for revenue growth seems to be giving investors pause. Joining us now, we've got Brent Bracelin, who is the Piper Sandler Equity Research Analyst for the cloud sector. Brent, always a pleasure to get some of your insights here. At first, just want to kind of summarize the quarter that was and and, you know, ultimately the lofty expectations for AI and the show me story really showing up strong here for both of these companies that we're tracking this morning, Google, Alphabet and Microsoft as well as investors are certainly expecting more here. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to put things into perspective. Um, generative AI is one year old. We're one year into this new uh, AI cycle uh, of Microsoft. They disclosed their AI business actually doubled sequentially. It's now a $4.4 billion run rate business in year one. I remind you, Azure, which we're talking about Azure, investors all excited by Azure, it took a decade for Azure to get to 10 billion. Uh, at Microsoft AI, it's at 4.4 billion in, in one year. So things are happening very fast. I think that uh, it is year one. Uh, I can't wait to see what year two, year three, and year four bring for Microsoft AI. Mm -hmm. uh, but it also is important to put into perspective the 10% stock move ahead of earnings year to date in Microsoft and the 60% move in Microsoft over the last year. So yes, expectations are high. Maybe people always want more uh, AI uh, because it's exciting and it's new. Uh, but I'll remind you and put things into perspective, a $4.4 billion number is a big number in uh, essentially what is essentially the first year of, of rollout. Yeah, well, put that further into context for us. You mentioned that there's still lots of questions about what year two is going to look like. What are your expectations for year two? And then also tagging on to that, there has been at least some chatter here from the street this morning that maybe some of the strength that we saw driven by AI in the Azure business, maybe that is clouding or masking the slowing core Azure base. Is there any truth to that? Absolutely. I think we're in a classic case here where we saw earnings reports out of the vast majority of the cloud 100 that would suggest during Q3, um, things started to stabilize. In Q4, Microsoft's really the big first cloud company report, and they're showing stabilization, maybe a little bit more softness on the cloud optimization, Azure optimization side, more than offset by AI. Um, Microsoft is unique in that they have material AI, AI tailwinds, other cloud companies might not benefit as much as Microsoft and insulate in them, but classic case where investors think that things will get better, fundamentals aren't necessarily rebounding yet across the group. So I think it's a little early to call a fundamental call. I think expectations are fundamentals will improve at some point, just no evidence that it's happening now. Microsoft has the benefit of AI that's helping uh, insulate their business for sure. We've been watching a wave of tech layoffs to begin the year here, Brent, and, and reallocation of, of human resources at a lot of these companies. You know, how does this kind of position these companies for the next iteration of growth? And then ultimately, what, what is the impact on their business as well? 
I think the reality for these cloud companies and even the reality for Microsoft is investments in AI are going to cost dollars and you have to offset those dollars with efficiency. And it's not just Microsoft that's going to be investing in AI, every company is going to be investing in AI. And so I think there's just a greater focus on as we think about this next cycle, it's not just about accelerating growth, you need to accelerate growth and improve margins. Unfortunately, that's going to be tied to some cost optimization internal efforts, uh, both on vendors as well as uh, employees. So uh, it's a bit of the new reality, you have to do both. Uh, you can't just accelerate top line and, and not drive profitability as well. Hey, Brent, how should we be looking at this in terms of what we could hear from some of the other software players? There has been some weakness. I know you don't, you don't cover Google, but when we take a look into the fact that investors have priced in so much of this hype already into these stocks, what do you think these results that we've gotten over the last 12 to 24 hours tell us about what we could expect from some of those other big players within AI? Digestion. I think it's a classic case where we see market tops, market bottoms, uh, we're entering a new cycle, but valuations have run ahead of fundamentals across the vast majority of these cloud software names. And so we're probably going to enter a period here where we need to have fundamentals catch up with multiples. Uh, we've seen material multiple expansion since the 10-year uh, rates have dropped materially by almost one percentage point in the last three months, uh, and valuations have run well ahead of fundamentals. We do think fundamentals will improve. Our CIO surveys are suggesting uh, IT spend optimism is going to improve. It just hasn't happened yet, and it's partially reflected in these stocks. So I think we're entering a period of digestion. All right, Brent Bracelin, always great to get your insight here. Thanks so much for hopping on with us this morning. Piper Sandler, Equity Research Analyst for the cloud sector. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, let's get to another big name reporting results. A Starbucks posting a disappointing first quarter earnings report, but investors, they don't seem too phased. Shares of the coffee chain actually moving higher ahead of the open, despite missing estimates on both the top and bottom line, also cutting full year guidance. For more on that, we want to bring in Rachel Ruggieri, Starbucks's chief financial officer, also with us, Yahoo Finance a senior reporter, Brooke De Palma. Great to have both of you here. Rachel, let's talk about the quarter and some of the trends that you are seeing, because yes, investors seem to be brushing some of the weakness aside, but I'm curious how you're navigating this clear slowdown that maybe we are starting to see in the consumer and how that is now fa factoring into maybe your pricing strategy going forward. Sure. Well, thank you for having me. Um, let me just start by saying, you know, we had a strong quarter in Q1 and it was really driven by our most loyal customers remaining engaged across the globe. And so as we think about going forward, you know, as we look to some maybe more near term and transitory headwinds, what we're really focused on is continuing to drive customers into our rewards program. And we're using targeted and efficient ways to be able to do that, encourage frequency of visits, maybe encourage another attach, driving afternoon day part. So we have a lot of power in our very proprietary, personalized engine that goes with our, um, our digital capabilities. So that's one way. Another thing we're doing is we're really amping up our voice on social media as it relates to awareness of our products and our innovation, as well as our brand. I mean, I think we have incredible uh, products and and that was demonstrated in Q1. You know, we saw a record ticket in our U.S. business, highest that we've seen in over 50 years. And that was really driven by the innovation we drove, specifically in cold around coffee, around tea, as well as the attach we had in our food offering. So we have an ability to continue to drive that through our innovation, but it's important that our customers broadly, particularly our more occasional customers or customers that aren't in our rewards program, need to know about that. So we're leveraging social media to amplify that. And in addition to that, that helps drive our revenue, but we've been able to unlock pretty significant efficiencies in our business through our triple shot strategy, which gives us a lot of opportunity to drive the 15 to 20% earnings growth that we are firmed on a full year basis. We had great success in Q1 uh, with that and we'll continue on that journey. And that's what's giving us the confidence to be able to meet our full year expectations. Rachel, I do want to quickly dive into those personalized promotions that you're doing. Do you think AI technology alone can help boost foot traffic back to previous levels here in the US and abroad? Well, we've always used a form of AI. We have a deep brew technology that we've used that backs our personalization. And, and so, yes, I would say the ability to leverage data analytics to go into specific cohorts within our Starbucks Rewards uh, member base helps us to understand how do you target uh, 
occasions? How do you target attach? Things of that nature. We're being more targeted in terms of uh, favorites, in terms of options for customers based on their preferences. So there's a lot of opportunity. The goal is to bring more customers into that program. We had an increase in the U.S. business of 13% in the quarter, and that grew. That re- We had a record 59% of tender, so very engaged customer base. But as you continue to bring more customers in and you personalize the offerings, there's a lot of opportunity there, both in terms of traffic, but as well as in terms of ticket. When you think about that ticket, the change in ticket declined internationally 3% when you compare the quarters. And then you saw deceleration here in the U.S. What type of pricing maneuvering do you believe you're going to have to implement in order to make sure that you still have demand generation that's successfully going forward to have that foot traffic, as Brooke was mentioning, coming in the door, but also spending at a level that is consistent with previous quarters? Yeah. Let me address the ticket in international first, which is largely driven by our business in China, where we had a negative ticket of about 9%. That's largely driven by, uh, because we have a more cautious consumer environment, we saw lower spending. And so that impacted our merch sales, which tend to be higher ticket. And in addition to that, we saw a greater promotional environment. We also promoted, but we believe, you know, that what we want to go after is being in the premium market. So we want to be more targeted with our promotions going forward. So we don't see a continued continuation of our ticket in that way. We expect to be very targeted in how we bring our customers into the program. As it relates more broadly, and we look at our U.S. business and how we think about um, that ticket, the opportunity continues to create value. You know, our customers, if we continue to innovate and provide that value, then they they will come in for that experience. And that's what we see in terms of how we drive that ticket and how we drive that opportunity. It's it's intended to be very targeted, but it's also intended to be driven through innovation. When we can connect with our customers in ways that resonate, that gives them optionality, which can drive both traffic but as well as ticket. Rachel, to be clear, do you plan to pull back on any of those price hikes you've taken? We do. We learned a lot um, in Q1, largely in our U.S. business, and we were able to successfully drive afternoon with those offers as well as increase the membership in our rewards program. But we learned a lot through that, and we're going to be going forward much more targeted and surgical about those promotional offerings because there's a greater efficiency. So you will see a shift in terms of how we promote. And and going off of that more specifically, what you're seeing in China, because the largely the criticism, or at least what analysts have been pointing out, is the fact that you're up against competitors who are offering products that are much cheaper. So how do you then bridge that gap? Because it's a very different, different pricing strategy than what is playing out right here in the U.S. Yeah. We look at that. That strategy is really around, you know, creating uh, consumption. So getting trial and consumption. And we do believe that over time we will benefit from that. We continue to focus on being premium. And that means a premium experience. And we have distinct and competitive advantages to drive that, including a very locally relevant coffee forward innovation strategy with our beverages and our food. We saw some good success with that in this quarter and we'll continue that. But we expect that over time, you're going to start to see the per capita coffee consumption increase, which is a good thing and we'll benefit from that. But the market will start to mature and we believe there'll be a tiering and we're going to continue to strengthen our position in the premium market because we believe we're well positioned to lead. So that's how we're going to continue in the environment that we're in today. Rachel, Lakshman made it very clear on the call yesterday afternoon that there has been no union busting playbook at Starbucks. You, stores that voted to unionize now make about 4% up of the U.S. portfolio. Should investors think of unionized stores as just part of Starbucks moving forward? You know, what I would say is we still believe a direct relationship with our partners is best because it allows us to deliver the brand experience. But we recognize there are partners, you know, choose to have representation from a union. And we're committed to be able to have a constructive dialogue and a path forward to work with the unions and with with all partners. But where we continue to be focused is really through our triple shot strategy. It's all around continuing to elevate the experience for our partners. We've listened to our partners. We've made pretty significant investments over the past couple of years and will continue to do so. And that's driven lower turnover and more stability in our stores. We were very successful this quarter as it relates to the investments. The investments are driving tangible financial benefits, but also they're a differentiator for us because we know that our partners are and always will be a differentiator. And so it's important for us to continue to invest over the long term. Rachel Ruggieri, who is the Starbucks CFO and our very own Brooke De Palma, joining us this morning to help break down the earnings. Rachel, thanks so much for the time. Appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. See you soon. 
All eyes are on Boeing today after fourth quarter reported, uh, after the company reported fourth quarter earnings, excuse me, amid an ongoing investigation into its 737 MAX 9 planes. Boeing narrowed its losses last year, but postpones giving an outlook for 2024 with its CEO saying now is not the time for that. For a deeper dive into those results, Robert Spingarn, Melius Research Managing Director, and Eric Desenhall, who is the Desenhall Resources Chairman and Co-Founder, join us now here. Uh, gentlemen, thanks for taking the time here on the morning. I mean, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, and, and Robert, perhaps I'll begin with you, because ultimately, when we think about a company pulling guidance uh, and, and actually just not even giving guidance, in this case, as Boeing has done, what does that signal about the, the actual reality that this company is navigating through? Well, Brad, I, I think one thing here is they really never guided to 24. If you go back to their November 22 investor day, they guided to 23 and then also longer term guide over uh, for 25 and 26. That guide is for 10 million in free cash flow. And I think that's where most people have anchored their valuation. So the, the fact that there's no guide here isn't really a suspension so far as I can tell, but it is more, uh, it's just a deferral, if you will, because of the uncertainty and I would attach that to not wanting to get ahead of the FAA. The FAA has asked for a freeze on the 737, arguably the most important product they do. And I think they're just being smart and not trying to get ahead of the regulator. Yeah, Eric, when we heard uh, Boeing uh, CEO Dave Calhoun saying the fact that they're pulling guidance because they want to focus on safety, some of the other lines that stuck out to me in his letter here to employees saying that the increased scrutiny is going to make us better, also that they have much to prove to earn our stakeholders' confidence. Eric, how would you grade the handling of this Boeing situation by Dave Calhoun so far? Well, you have to remember how I make my living. It's crisis management. So it's not, there's a difference between damage control and damage never happened. Damage has happened. I think that he's doing a pretty solid job and we shouldn't confuse how he's doing with the fact that there is a crisis. I mean, I think that they really have uh, two things ahead of them. One is the tactical issue. What do you do about these planes? When you pull the planes from, from the air, which the government and the company has done, uh, uh, you cauterize the immediate safety problem. It's ultimately an engineering problem. People try to make it a PR problem as if communication solves it. But the fact is, you solve the engineering problem, you solve the immediate crisis. Second, you have a broader strategic issue, which is, how, uh, why are these things happening every few years at this company? Uh, the popular theory, and I can't confirm it, is that there is a cultural issue, a focus on money rather than making good planes. But whatever they do, they're going to have to talk about both the short-term tactical issues and the longer-term strategic issues. And, and so with that in mind, Eric, I'll just follow up there. It's clear that they're going to have to communicate to some of their biggest customers out there that this is going to impact delivery timelines. And so what is the successful way that you would like to see management kind of being proactive about what the reality is for those timelines, how that's gonna to need to be adjusted and the expectations that some of their business customers have, big biggest customers have? Well, I think in, in situations like this, people wanna know two things. Are we going to be okay and what are you doing about it? They're never going to be thrilled with, with the answer, but what people cannot stand is uncertainty. The idea that we have no idea what's going on. And so what I think is going to have to happen is they are going to have to grab a hold of as many things as they can reasonably promise without getting ahead of what they really know and getting ahead of regulators because you know this is not all under Calhoun's control which is one of the reasons I get so skeptical of this obsession the media tend to have with head rolling the CEO as if this solves everything I, I I really don't believe that it does so Robert let's talk about what this could mean then for share price going forward you are still relatively bullish going into this print we know shares have been under a tremendous amount of pressure the worst performer that we have seen in the Dow so far this year What's the catalyst then ahead? What is it going to take in order to turn around some of this momentum? Well, I, I, one of the catalysts is potentially the earnings call today, you know, depending on what they say about this 2025, 2026 target. Now that may be potentially suspended as well. That's, that's the right word to use there because that's an existing target. And again, that's where investors are focused. So people will want to know if this 737 freeze can roll into let's say 2026, I don't think anybody realistically was expecting them to hit the $10 billion target in 25. 
And the good news is they did say this morning that the exit rate on 737 production is 38 per month. And that gets you pretty clear. Even without the guidance, you can do the math. 38 per month on the 37, five per month on the 787 gets you roughly where consensus is for 2024. So if you do the math yourself, it's not that far off, which is why I think the shares are positive this morning. Robert Spingar and Eric Dezenhall, we have to leave it there. Thanks so much for joining us here this morning, breaking down Boeing's report that we got again. Shares moving higher ahead of the open, up just about 2%. All right, well, coming up, we've got the opening bell on Wall Street. Again, pressure on the NASDAQ following the disappointing reports, at least in investors' eyes, from some of those big tech giants. More on that when we come back. All right, just about three minutes here until the opening bell. Let's take a look at one of the big movers here, our stock to watch, and that is AMD. Shares are sinking in pre-market trading off just about 4%. The company giving sales expectations for the first quarter that fell short of what the street had anticipated. The chip maker, though, did give an upbeat forecast for its AI chips. Massa Mills standing by on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange with the latest on the move to the downside, Maddie, that we're seeing in the stock this morning. Yeah, good forward guidance for AMD, but not good enough. They updated their AI chips revenue forecast for 2024 to $3.5 billion from $2 billion. The street was looking for $6 billion, so a tripling of that forecasted revenue. But that's not a crazy anticipation given some of the revenue forecasting that we've seen from other chips players in the space. Think about, obviously, NVIDIA, huge competitor to an AMD, and even Intel coming out with that record-breaking earnings print last week and that's going to add a little bit of pressure to a name like AMD which analysts this morning telling me it was already priced in the upside to this name that we got from that earnings print was already priced in we've seen a doubling in this stock just over the past quarter it's up 26 percent year to date so the street was looking for a little bit more good news in that earnings picture than they got yesterday now having said that they have this new product right it's the mi300x chip it's a gpu that you're going to be using for that ai uh, play there uh, the big customers for this chip are microsoft oracle and meta and we're not going to see the revenue from that product until the second half of this year so that could be a good indicator for this name heading into the latter half of 2024 
that they're going to have a little bit more upside. But again, if we look at the stock today, not a lot of upside there. Seeing a lot of red, not just with AMD, but across the big tech sector as well. All right, Maddie, thanks so much. We have been talking about that I hear the sporting Brad. When we talk about the fact that these lofty expectations, so much hype going into many of these AI names, it's already been priced in. If they miss on any metric or fall short or really fail, to significantly surpass those expectations. We're seeing that reflected in the stock price. Yeah, absolutely. We're tracking, of course, those big tech earnings. We're also tracking how the street is reacting to ADP private payrolls that were out this morning, too, where annual pay was up by about 5.2% and 107,000 jobs added. Here is the opening bell on Wall Street. And there we go. We got the phones out for the opening bell down on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange as we kick off what could be a very busy trading day here for investors, investors digesting that big tech miss or disappointments that we got after the bell yesterday, carrying over into today. And then, of course, looking ahead to this afternoon, Fed Chair Jay Powell, we have the decision from the Fed and then his conference that's kicking off uh, later on this afternoon. Any sort of update in terms of Fed rate cut timing? Not expecting uh, anything too significant, but if we do, that could really potentially move markets here. We've got team coverage for you. Some of the biggest movers that we're seeing at the open. Mass and Mill still standing by on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Jared Blickery standing by at the big board with a look at some of the movement that we're seeing right here at the open. But, Maddie, let me toss to you. What's the sentiment from traders on the floor this morning following the results that we got last night? It was a big sigh from traders this morning, right, saying here we are with another down day. Interestingly, they pointed out to me that, yes, we're obviously seeing a lot of red on the screen. If I look at how the performance of the major indices is looking so far this morning, we're seeing the S&P 500 down almost half a percent, even the Russell down four tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq obviously uh, getting a bigger ding because of the big tech misses that we saw last night down a little over one percent in the morning trade. And you would expect to see that if you're seeing a lot of downward movement in the stock market and the equity space that you'd maybe get a lift in treasuries. Not so much today. We're seeing the 10-year yield down as well. And that could be an indication that traders are not only focusing on those big tech earnings, but like you mentioned, Shauna, they're anticipating the Fed meeting later today. And even though it's widely consensus at this point that we're obviously not going to get a cut today, we're clinging to this hope that we could get some more indication from Fed Chair Jay Powell about what the Fed's next moves are going to be. Will we get a one-word in implication as to whether or not we're going to see a Fed cut coming as soon as March. The street is anticipating that today, and that's why we're seeing a little bit of a question mark movement more on those misses from big tech earnings this morning as opposed to any forward-looking anticipation of positive tech earnings coming up later this week with Apple and Amazon. Now, having said that, Microsoft was tipping into the green just at the start of my hit here. Now they're about flat, so we could see the street uh, forward guidance on Microsoft looking good. Dan Ives this morning reiterating bullishness on Microsoft, saying, Saying that the earnings call yesterday should be printed up and put in the Louvre. Uh, so we're seeing the street continue to look for positive signs amidst this sea of red this morning in the big tech names, uh, including the AMD and chip sector that I just mentioned as well. All right, Dan Ives, never short of metaphors at all. Maddie, thanks so much for tracking the latest moves from down there at the floor of the exchange. We've also got Jared Blickery here at the home base with the Wi-Fi Interactive, the heat map internationally pulled up. Yes, you bet, Brad. Thank you. Uh, we're only seeing the Dow in the green here. NASDAQ down 1%. And let's just take a look at the two-day total, 1.8% uh, to the downside. Russell 2000, the small caps down about 7 tenths of a percent. Healthcare was leading before the market opened. We'll have to see what's, and there it is, healthcare up uh, 7 tenths of a percent, followed by utilities, then financials, then materials, real estate, all of those outperforming, all of those in the green. Communications services. Guess what that house is? Alphabet. That's down 1.8%. Tech, that has Microsoft. That's down 1%. Those are the only two underperformers. And let's just skip to the NASDAQ 100 where you can see Alphabet. I think that's the biggest downdraft we've seen in few weeks, if not a few months, down 5.5%. Uh, Microsoft in the green for six tenths of a percent. NVIDIA down 1.5%. Also, AMD released earnings after the bell yesterday. That's down 3.8%. Just want to take a, a little bit of a look at the sector action. I showed you what's happening today. Let me show you what's happened since the October lows. Now, it's been exactly three months or 63 trading days since that low. And we do see tech in the, in the pull position. They're up 23%. But guess what? 
financials on its heels. Uh, I've been tracking financials over the last few weeks, and you take a look at the two-year chart, we just had a big breakout from previous levels. Maybe you can see this on the three. You're, there you go. We had this resistance level, and we are now off to the upside. So financials, another sector we're going to be tracking, especially as everybody's asking for that uh, mega cap seven rally to be brought in out. And that's really what we're talking about right here. You certainly are. All right, Jared, thanks so much for breaking down the movements that we're seeing here at the open. Let's get more on some of the trending tickers here at the open and starting with Novo Nordisk, a sparking optimism by projecting revenue can grow as much as 26 percent this year, soaring past five hundred billion dollars in market value fueled by the success of its weight loss drug, Wagovi, and diabetes drug, Ozempic. Now, the company's CFO telling Yahoo Finance earlier this morning, quote, the plans for 2024 are to continue the amazing growth we saw in 2023. It's the same growth drivers and more or less the same magnitude of growth we're looking into for 2024. Ozempic and Wagovi, as well as some of their other drugs, really being the key growth drivers here for the stock. And I think these results, Brad, really point to exactly why Nova Nordisk was named Yahoo Finance's 2023 company of the year. We're seeing that market cap now push beyond 500 billion, becoming just the second European company to reach that milestone. But again, the demand, the frenzy for Wagovi, Novo Nordisk still struggling to keep up with what exactly that demand looks like. Yeah, demand generation has been there and organic growth here that we've been tracking has certainly just made its way all the way through their business, especially within that diabetes and obesity care segment here, where they actually note in this most recent quarter that increased by about 38 percent, mainly driven, they note, by GLP-1 diabetes sales growth read through there, of course, the weight loss drugs, the growth of that division of about 48%, that subsegment in there of GLP ones, and then obesity care, get this growing by 147% in this most recent quarter. It's, it's pretty astonishing yeah. when you take a look at these numbers. We know the company has further invested in order to try and boost their manufacturing so they can meet demand. So again, projections like that, you really think sky's almost the limit here for at least shares in the next 12 months, given the fact that it doesn't seem like demand is slowing down at all for these weight loss and obesity drugs. And it's also a theme that we've heard on a number of earnings calls going back to last quarter. We'll likely hear from a number of the consumer staple companies again this quarter. And stay tuned right here on Yahoo Finance. Our very own Anjali Kimlani spoke with Nova Nordisk's CFO. We're going to have that interview for you in the next hour. All right, let's get to our another trending ticker this morning, and that is Paramount Global skyrocketing on a Bloomberg report saying that media mogul Byron Allen has made a $14.3 billion offer to buy the company. Yahoo Finance's Alexandra Canal has been tracking this for us and here with the details, Allie. Yes, we finally have an actual offer on the table, $14.3 billion. This would buy out all of Paramount's outstanding shares. Now, according to this Bloomberg report, Allen offered $20.58 each for the company's voting shares. Now, that marks about a 50% premium compared to recent trading levels. And then for those non-voting shares, $21.53. So including all of that existing debt, this deal mounts to about $30 billion. Now, Allen reportedly has banks other investors uh, lined up here to help finance this. Investors were initially hesitant to think that he would be able to get the backing to get this deal done. But the fact that he seems more interested in maintaining those linear assets and selling off the studios and film side of the business, that makes things pretty interesting because we know the linear side, who wants to buy a, a dying linear business? We've seen cord cutting. We've seen advertising headwinds. Byron Allen says, you know what? I'm ready for the challenge. Uh, and then on the studio side, we know that Paramount is an attractive offer for a lot of potential buyers out there. We've seen films like Mission Impossible, uh, Top Gun Maverick, Paw Patrol. So there's going to be a lot of interest there. Byron Allen reportedly wants to keep the streaming side of the business, Paramount Plus. He wants to run it more efficiently. We know that side of the business has been bleeding money as of late. Paramount says that they've seen peak losses in direct-to-consumer in 2023, but we're still seeing uh, you know, that company not turn a profit. And on the heels of that, we've heard that they want to do layoffs. So there's just, there's been a lot of interest when it comes to this company. It's a small company. Our, our parent company um, has, Apollo Global has reportedly been interested, even a big conglomerate like Warner Brothers Discovery. Now Byron Allen in the mix. Could we get a bidding war perhaps? Maybe? 
But you're seeing good news for shareholders. Yeah, you're seeing shareholders <laughs> really liking this up more than 10 percent at the opening bell. You mentioned uh, Mission Impossible. That caught my attention. I mean, Byron Allen, friend or foe to Tom Cruise then at this point. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know which Mission Impossible we're at anymore. So seven, seven, seven or eight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah it was There's been school. a lot. He's going to be making those movies out. forever. My yeah. Goodness. But yeah, I mean, there are people out there that would want to own that studio. Or a little yeah, piece of certainly. Impossible. Very, very valuable. All right, Allie, thanks so much for bringing that down. First, again, Paramount shares up just about 12%. We'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Much more of your market action ahead. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Weaker than expected reading on private payrolls, boosting bets of a rate hike in March. As it stands right now, traders are split on a pivot from the Fed at the next meeting. Just over 50 percent pricing in a cut in March. So what does this mean ahead of the Fed decision that we're going to get this afternoon and also the conference here from Fed Chair Jay Powell? We want to bring in Mark Zandi. He's Moody's Analytics Chief Economist. Mark, it's great to have you here. So let's start with the jobs data that we got out this morning. ADP coming in a bit weaker than expected Although you have to square that with the jolts data that we got out yesterday morning that was a bit hotter than expected. What should, what do you think you have confidence in terms of the Fed doing, not so much at today's meeting, but what they should do looking ahead in March? Uh, well, Sean, I think they've got everything they need to start cutting rates. It's just a question of precisely when. I, 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 at this meeting, they'll let, kind of lay the foundation for that. Uh, I, I think they'll make the March meeting live, meaning uh, there is a potential for a cut there, depending on the data that come in on inflation and, and jobs. Uh, my, my sense, though, is that they'll probably be on the cautious side and just wait another few more weeks and probably the first rate cut will be in May. But uh, at this meeting, they'll lay the, the foundation, the, the groundwork for those cuts. I mean, BlackRock uh, and Gargi Chowdhury out this morning with a, a note and saying that they're anticipating four rate cuts, uh, the street trying to price in six. Where do you believe that this is going to kind of skew towards by the time we get to the end of the year? Yeah, I, I, four sounds about right to me, Brad. Uh, I think um, May... June, July, and then maybe after the election, there's a November meeting that comes right after the election. So that that would be four rate cuts, quarter point each time. That feels right. But, I, you know, I wouldn't argue with anybody who says five or six. I, you know, the thing is, uh, they're they're very close to their mandate. Uh, the economy is at full employment. The sub 4% unemployment rate is very consistent with a full employment economy. Inflation's coming in. Uh, if it's not at target, it's within spitting distance, and it's going to be there by the second half of the year. So, 
when you've achieved your goals, uh, full employment, inflation at target, infl the uh, the uh, funds rate should be pretty consistent with its uh, R star, its long run equilibrium. You know, the rate consistent with policy neither supporting or restraining growth, and th they've got a long way to get from here to there. So I think they need to start cutting rates this year in a, in a significant way. Mark, there's been uh, more and more talk just about the disruption that we could see or, or the disruption that we are seeing in global supply chains because of what is playing out in the Red Sea. What is your assessment just in terms of the risk that that then could potentially or does pose to inflation at this point in the short term? Yeah, you know, Shauna, I think it's certainly not great. Uh, and there's a lot of scenarios. It can go in lots of different directions. Uh, but I think the most likely scenario that, that the disruptions won't be enough to really change the inflation picture here in the U.S. in any meaningful way. It's adding to transportation costs, for sure, uh, for different types of goods. But goods are a small piece of the consumer pie, and the impact on overall inflation should be very modest. Now, now having said that, obviously, this can go in different directions and some uh, very dark directions. And if the if the, the Red Sea is completely shut down and the, the disruptions in the Middle East uh, uh, broaden out and affect the oil supplies from, let's say, Iran, then that's a different story altogether. But that doesn't seem like the most likely scenario at this point. Uh, you know, Mark, one other area that the Fed is tracking extremely closely to see how it plays into the broader inflation picture is housing. And, and particularly here to try and kind of put two different data points together, uh, ADP and, and the private payrolls that came out this morning, I mean, you've got a lot of employers that are telling employees that they got to come back to the office. You know, is that the next big factor, perhaps, that can shift the housing situation when you have people uh, that have anecdotally told us that they never thought that they'd have to move back to some of the cities that their office used to be in? Yeah, there's no going back, Brad. I know employers want people to come back, and they're going to try really hard, and the pendulum's starting to swing back a little bit. But there's no going back. I think uh, the die has been cast. The remote work is here to stay. As technology improves and you know makes it easier for people to communicate and feel like they're in the same room with each other, and, and also as new businesses form, they're not going to optimize around an office building. They're going to optimize around remote work dynamics. So I just don't see it. Uh, so no, I don't think that's going to uh, change the dial here. I mean, housing is really really important, but the the thing that matters there is affordability and you know supply and all those kinds of things that affect the cost of housing and rents and ultimately inflation. But in terms of remote work and housing, I, I don't see that changing. Mark, what, what are your expectations when it comes to homes and housing prices here over the next, say, 12 to 18 months? Because we have seen this run up here in prices. It almost seems like nothing's stopping it. Demand is still there. They're further pushing up the price of homes. Are we going to see any relief? Well, you know, I, I forecast lots of things, Sean. Some, some things that I, I felt pretty good about, like, no recession in 2023. I got house prices dead wrong. I thought we'd see some <laughs> more price declines in 2023. We saw them in 22 when interest rates first rose, but uh, increased, but that didn't happen in 23 because of the interest rate lock. People uh, with homes just aren't going to sell them because they have a three and a half percent mortgage and it doesn't make any economic sense to move. Uh, so uh, yeah, you have to consider that when uh, when I give you my rate, uh, my uh, outlook for, uh, for house prices. You know, my sense is at this point, what's going to happen is over time, uh, life changes. People are going to have to make changes in their housing situation. You know, children, death, divorce, job change, and when they when they have to move, and, and ultimately they will, they'll have to uh, become more aggressive on pricing, and we will see some price weakness. Not big price declines; it just isn't enough supply. Uh, but maybe prices go flat for a couple, three, four years, let incomes and interest rates catch up and restore affordability. So can housing still run hot and the Fed reach its mandate, its its target that it set for itself? Yeah, absolutely, because the key there is rents. And uh, rents are flat to down over the past year, and they're going to stay flat to down in the coming year or so, just because there's a lot of supply coming online in the rental market, particularly at the high end of the rental market, you know, these large uh, apartment uh towers that are going up in big urban centers around the country. So vacancy rates are now rising and rents are under pressure. And that's what drives the growth and the cost of housing services that's in the inflation statistics that we look at. So yeah, I, I, I think I feel, of all the things I forecast that, I feel confident that that's gonna come in. Mark, before we let you go, let's talk real quick about the consumer because you were kind enough to submit a chart for our uh, chart book series here at Yahoo Finance. And the chart that you submitted was all about wage growth. The fact that we have seen this rise 
across income levels. When you project that out to 2024, what are some of the trends? Do you expect that trend to continue in terms of the fact that consumers are going to be able to improve and maintain that purchasing power? Hey, that's a pretty cool chart, isn't it? It is. Oh, I, like I liked it. Yeah, it's very cool. Uh, <laughs> and you can see inflation, go back a year or two ago, inflation obviously was outpacing wage growth across the wage distribution, regardless of your low paid or high paid. And of course, that's what people are real uh, got really upset about, right, rightly so. And they're still upset about it. It's one reason why, even though the economy is performing well, people don't think it is because they feel the sting of that period back a couple, three years ago. But the good news, and you can see it in the chart, is inflation is now consistently and well below wage growth across the wage distribution. And you know, people that means people's purchasing power is improving, uh, and that's the fodder for continued spending and, and economic growth. And also, really critical to changing minds, you know, getting people starting to feel like, oh yeah, things are doing a little bit better. And you can see that in some of the sentiment indices, like we got the conference board survey, consumer confidence yesterday, much improved. So I think people are starting to feel this, that that graph is starting to work its magic. Cool charts and a Chester County connection. We love it here. Mark Zandi, <laughs> Moody's Analytics Chief Economist. Thanks so much. Take care. All your markets action straight ahead. Stay tuned, you're watching Yahoo Finance. Shares of Walmart edging a bit higher today, up just about eight tenths of a percent. The company announcing a three for one stock split. Let's go to Yahoo Finances. Brooke De Palma joining us back on set for the details here. Brooke. Hello again. Sure, certainly this is wowing investors after market close and now moving into higher, sort of settling in here. But this stock split will be payable after market close on Friday, February 23rd. But it's important to note here that you have to own shares at the end of market close on Thursday, February 22nd, 2024, that is. And then it will begin trading as such on Monday, February 26th. Now, CEO Doug McMillan saying here that they felt like it was a good time to split the stock and encourage their associates to participate in the year to come. Of course, Walmart is the largest employer here in the U.S. And this does increase the number of Walmart's outstanding common stock from 2.7 billion shares to 8.1 billion shares. And important to note here that this is the 11, uh, this is the uh, rather, there was 11 two-for-one splits. The last one occurred in 1999, but this is the first 
three for one split. And this comes on the heels of Walmart announcing earlier this week that starting in April, they will have all U.S. store managers eligible to receive up to $20,000 in stock grants. But it really depends on what store they run, whether it be a superstore and for more of a typical store, that stock grant would be roughly 10000 Yeah, this is one of our trending tickers on the Yahoo Finance platform here today. Brooke, thanks so much for breaking it down. Coming up, we've got all your markets action straight ahead. Musk in the hot seat again, this time after a Delaware judge rejects Tesla's pay package. What it means for his companies, we're going to be digging into that after the break. Elon Musk back in the spotlight, a Delaware judge ruling that the Tesla founder is not entitled to his $55.8 billion pay package from 2018, calling it not entirely fair. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Alexis Keenan to give us the details here. Alexis, what have we found here? Yeah, so not entirely fair, and this is a special standard that the Delaware Chancery Court is able to apply. It's a heightened standard that shifts the burden and puts it onto the board of directors at Tesla to show that they did go through a fair process with regard to the price of Musk's compensation, as well as the process for how they got there. So this was a derivative suit. It was brought by Tesla shareholders in Delaware Chancery Court. They allege that the, the board of directors 
breached their fiduciary duty when they came up with this compensation package by okaying what they said was excessive performance-based compensation. That, of course, was all in the form of equity, still unexercised, undistributed to Elon Musk. The judge said that the board uh, didn't meet this burden and wrote that the members of the compensation committee at Tesla, that they testified to a lack of negotiation over arriving at these figures. The judge also applied, like I said, this heightened standard for transactions. And these are when the transactions between the board uh, and an executive that they are uh, talking with an executive with a controlling uh, stake in the company. So that's what brings this heightened standard into play here. The judge also noted here that Musk's personal relationships with board members and the general counsel were not fully disclosed to shareholders when they voted on this package. And it's important here to note that the Chancery Court, it's a special court, it's a court of equity, and it has really broad discretion in order to remedy what they see as breaches of fiduciary duty. So uh, it's going to get a lot of attention in corporate circles here because this is one of the first times, if not the first time, that the Delaware court is establishing that there's such a thing called excessive compensation or putting a lot of guardrails around what that really means. Uh, also, uh, in response to this decision, Musk tweeting out uh, that he recommends not even incorporating in Delaware and instead going to Nevada or to Texas, where he's already re established relationship with his various companies. Guys? He uh, clearly communicated his frustrations on X. No surprise there. Alexis Keenan, thanks so much for breaking that down for us. Well, we've got much more of your market action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith. We are about 30 minutes into the trading day, 33 to be exact. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up stocks right now. You're seeing the U.S. major averages uh, mixed as the Dow has just barely, well, it's flirting with positive territory as best it can, oscillating, hyper-oscillating between gains and losses flat. For the Dow, S&P 500, you're seeing that down by about 7 tenths of a percent. And tech-heavy Nasdaq certainly getting hit by some of those earnings reports that have have come out here from the magnificent seven companies pushing it lower by about 1.2 percent right now all right let's take a look at some of those individual movers first up the Brazilian consumer really helping MasterCard this quarter shares up just about two percent on better than expected fourth quarter results Revenue was up 13%. That marked the second quarter in a row that we saw growth there in sales. All right, the company of the Venn diagram. And Philips 66 also reporting strong results. The company is saying it expects a 5% boost in refining market capture by next year as it has 10 to 15 projects annually. This comes as the Philips 66 is facing pressure from activist investor Elliott Management. Elliott Investment Management over higher operating expenses. And SoFi, under a bit of pressure this morning, off just about 1%. Morgan Stanley warning of revenue headwinds. Now the analysts downgrading SoFi to underweight, talking about some risks that they see ahead for the company's new profitability targets. Well, the big story of the day, one of the big stories of the day, Wall Street counting down to the Federal Reserve's first interest rate decision of the year. Investors are eager to hear from Fed Chair Jay Powell, hoping to get some insight on the timing of a potential rate cut. Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schaumberger has the latest on that for us. Jen. Hey there, Shauna. Yeah, the Federal Reserve meeting underway for about an hour here in Washington, where Fed officials are widely expected to hold rates steady, but try to temper Wall Street's expectations for just how quickly the central bank could begin cutting rates. Here are three things to watch at this afternoon's policy decision. Number one, will the Fed set the table to signal that rates are more likely to fall than to rise in the coming months? Some are hoping to see a tweak in the language of the official statement, indicating that it no longer has a tightening bias to set the stage for eventual cuts. Number two, will Fed Chair Powell try to walk back Wall Street on how soon the Fed will cut and how many times they'll cut? Investors are betting five cuts in 2024 and that they will begin in either March or May. Fed officials have cautioned they're not in a rush to cut rates, with Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester even saying outright that March was too early. Fed Chair Powell is expected to try to peel Wall Street back from the five rate cuts that investors have priced in versus the three penciled in by the Fed. And number three, how will the Fed navigate higher economic growth and could it cause them to remain on pause for longer? The challenge for the Fed is that economic growth continues to surprise to the upside, clocking in at 3.3 percent in the fourth quarter, even as inflation has continued to drop. That is some questioning whether inflation could reaccelerate and cause the Fed to hold rates at current levels for longer. This decision coming down at 2 p.m. Eastern, followed by Fed Chair Powell's press conference at 2.30. I will have it for you live here in Washington. Jennifer, Back to you. appreciate it so much. We're going to be tracking the market movements leading up to and through that decision. Thanks. The major indices mixed this morning as investors digest weak tech outlooks. Historically, the January barometer has been used as an indicator for investors, implying that the return seen in January can be used to predict the outcome for the rest of the year. Will that be the case this year? Let's bring in Sam Stovall, who is the CFRA Research Chief Investment Strategist, to discuss more. Sam, always a pleasure to get some of your insights. So will the Jan January barometer hold true? What is the, the probability that what we've seen over the course of this month can perhaps be some type of indicator for the rest of 2024? Hey, Brad, good to talk to you again. Um, yeah, actually, the January barometer, which uh, popularized by the Stock Traders Almanac, uh, is a good early warning indicator as to where stocks are going to be get going for the uh, rest of the year. Uh, going back to World War II, if we've had a positive January in an election year, the market was up by more than 15.5% and rose in price every single time. Obviously, that's not a guarantee that that'll happen this year, but it's an encouraging statistic. In addition, it basically says that you let your winners ride, meaning the three best performing sectors in January tend to outperform the market in the entire year when all is said and done. 
Well, Sam, what are these results here, at least the reaction that we're getting from Microsoft and Alphabet on the heels of their results? Could that maybe pour a little bit of cold water on at least the momentum that we have seen over the last couple of weeks? Sure, Sean. I mean, it could indicate that maybe this year is positive, but not by as much as the average for all going back to World War II. But at the same time, uh, when we read the research notes on our Market Scope Advisor platform from Angelo Zeno, who covers Microsoft and Google, essentially uh, you'll see that we raised our target to 455 from 420 increased our earnings estimates for fiscal year 24 and 25, very impressed with Azure cloud growth. And so the thought on Microsoft is that we keep it as a strong buy recommendation. Uh, maintaining our buy recommendation on Google, also raising target price, earnings estimates, et cetera. So I think investors were looking for some reason to try to lock in some profits, uh, maybe because they're worried that this advance has gone on a little too far and a little too long. So saying then, should investors be looking at this or movements like today when we see those types of losses in some of these big tech giants, should they be using that as an opportunity to buy? I think so. I mean, we're still anticipating 15% earnings growth for the technology sector in 2024 as compared with 9.6% uh, for the S&P 500. One thing I do have to uh, warn investors about is the PE on forward 12-month earnings for the tech sector keeps bumping up against that 30 threshold, which really has been the high watermark over the last 20 years. So we'll probably need to see uh, an increase in earnings estimates for 2024 to allow this group to continue to work its way higher. Uh, don't expect PE multiple expansion. What are margins telling us about the, the strength of businesses navigating through this environment right now, Sam? Well, margins are, are holding up relatively well. And actually, uh, one of the comments made about Microsoft is that despite the elevated spend on artificial intelligence, uh, we see a clear path uh, to ongoing operating margin expansion. So for a lot of these tech stocks, uh, they are able to maintain or grow their margins. So when it goes to some of those opportunities outside of big tech, in terms of the checklist, what investors should be keeping in mind if they're trying to capitalize on some of the gains that you're expecting before year end? What's top of mind? Well, I would say, uh, again, that uh, history tells us to let your winners ride as it relates to uh, prior year performances, uh, especially after an up year. So don't give up just yet on communication services and start to consider interest in the financial sector. Uh, this is a group that's been beaten up for quite some time, but we're actually starting to see an improvement in earnings expectations, also an improvement in underlying momentum. Uh, so at this point in time, even though while we might see a digestion of gains, my expectation is it'll be uh, no more than a 10% correction in the marketplace. Short term, we could probably see a pop from the defensives as the market does digest recent gains. But I think for the full year, uh, stick with groups like tech, communication services, and financials. Is there one key word that this market should continue to monitor from the Fed and its tenor about the future and, and pacing of rate cuts? Well, I'll give you three. Later and fewer. Uh, later, meaning that the Fed will likely start to cut rates later than the Wall Street is anticipating right now. It won't be in March, in our opinion. It'll be in the second quarter, possibly at uh, the June FOMC meeting, and fewer, meaning that we think we'll have three 25 basis point rate cuts this year, not the five that is currently anticipated by Wall Street, mainly because the Fed does not want to make the mistakes that it made back in the 1970s. So uh, just as it took its time starting the rate tightening program, I think it'll be fairly cautious as to the timing and magnitude of the rate cuts ahead. Sam Stovall, always great to get your perspective here, especially on a big day like today. We appreciate you taking the time. CFRA's Research Chief Investment Strategist. All right, we'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Much more of your market action ahead. We'll be right back.
Dating app stocks in focus today as Match Group reports a drop in paying Tinder users. It's its fifth quarter in a row of that, a potential worrisome sign for the sector. But in two weeks, we are going to hear from another big player in this space. We've got Grindr set to report its results on February 12th. Shares have certainly been on a tear over the last year, up nearly 60%, still though trading around half of the debut price. Let's talk about the recent momentum, though, that we have seen in the name for that here with us at the desk. We want to bring in George Arison. He's the CEO of Grindr, alongside Yahoo Finance's executive editor, Brian Sazi. It's great to have you here at the desk with us, George. Let's talk about the momentum that you've seen in your business. Going back to the previous results, you certainly have seen tremendous amount of growth, revenue up 39%. What have you seen in terms of some of those trends carrying over here into the new year? Yeah, so... We gave guidance in November that the year was going to be really positive. We raised our guidance in November and in August, so it's been a really good year for us. Um, and we also said that we expect 2024 to go really well. Um, so far, everything's going as well as we expected. Obviously, we've not done earnings yet, so I'm going to be a little careful in what I say. But Grindr is a really great business, and we have users who are very dedicated to the platform. They're spending about an hour a day in it. Um, and the really big thing for us coming in, I started about 60 months ago now, has been to think about monetization, right? How do we build features that users want to pay for? Because that's not been the focus historically at Grindr, but that's where kind of what we're focused on now. And I think results so far are very positive. Is the did the large move in the stock price, George, you think, in part because investors are thinking about AI and how it might unlock growth or that monetization you're talking about? And what are you working on in AI? Yeah, I mean, I hope the movement in the share price is that we've had five quarters of awesome results. And so that's hopefully why the stock's moving. Uh, I think we've been delivering and I think we've been really careful and showing our investors that we have ability to have predictable results uh, into the future. That's, I think, really important as a kind of big company when you come out. Um, and we've been trying very carefully not raise expectations too high. Uh, from the AI perspective, you know, I think AI is going to really change dating in general, both in terms of how people converse with each other and also who is matched with who. Because a lot of really important information is sitting inside people's chats uh, and kind of that they are actually much more real in who they are in those chats versus the profile that you try to build based on like, hey, I think this is what people want to see. And if you have better information about users, obviously with that permission, you can match them with other users a lot better. Um, Grindr doesn't do matching yet, but that's kind of the direction we want to go into for dating in particular. So I think dating will be really changed by AI. Um, and that's all kind of on the come. Uh, and, you know, people are in some other apps frustrated with kind of in real world versus what happens online uh, experience. We don't have that issue with our users, but I still think that potential for me to make people meet each other better is, is really huge. That's a significant value proposition that you're adding into the service as well. How does that then have an impact on, on pricing when you're thinking about how you're extracting the yeah. most value out of your users too? Well, I'm, I'm, the way I tend to think of it is if you provide really awesome product to users and they gain value from it, they should be willing to pay for that, right? That's kind of the capitalist system. Um, I, so far, we have had two pricing tiers, a 1999 tier that we call extra and a, 20, a 3999 tier that um, we call unlimited. We then this year added a weekly product that's 1299 in the U.S. Um, for those that want to do that. And that's actually one of the reasons why our paying user numbers have gone up, because people who didn't pay before are now using the weekly. Um, I think there's a potential for a much higher price tier, you know, much higher being like, I don't know if it's $60 or $80, kind of TBD, but we'll experiment for the kind of more, more dating set of features. Um, and then there's probably an opportunity for a lower price tier as well for the younger user set. Um, I, Tinder does that, others do that as well. We've not done that, but I think there's opportunity there. And then, you know, Tinder's been experimenting with this like $500 a month tier. That's something much more kind of concierge style and special. Again, I think there is an opportunity there as well. So I think pricing can be a lot broader than what we're doing today. But first, we need to build a lot more features to justify a higher price. And that's what we're going to spend, you know, 2024 and 2025 focused on. What's the, the big features um, that you can speak to for this year? So one of the things we've talked about in the past is teleport. Our users travel a ton. Um, they are on the road a lot because they have time and disposable income to do it. Um, but you can today show your profile in a different market from the one you're in. And so enabling users to do that is something a lot of our users have been asking for. I've had people walk up to me at conferences and be like, I will pay $1,000 a year for this. And I'm like, well, you're in luck. It's coming. So that's one of the ones that really excited about being able to express an interest in a user a lot more than just sending a message is another one. Um, our peers have done that for a long time. We don't. We think that's a huge opportunity. Uh, and then ultimately analytics about a user. So like, this is what we know about this user. Do you want to know that information as well? I think something that users will really appreciate as well. How frequently do they respond to messages? You know, what, what kind of individual they want to talk to, et cetera. 
George, there has been some talk about using Grindr as a networking, a job networking tool as well. What do you see as the potential opportunity there and who you almost rival or you view as a potential rival within that space? Yeah, we definitely get compared a lot to obviously Match and Bumble, and that's yeah. the primary use case. But our users are there for a lot of other reasons. When you serve them as, like, as casual dating, huge percentage dating and other really large percentages, but then social connections and friendships and networking are also really high on the list as well when you give them a reason for why they're in the app. Uh, and that kind of speaks to the fact that our users view Grindr as a social networking community in addition to a dating product. Uh, and so I don't, there's really nothing analogous to that out there. And our users also don't leave the app. Once you kind of couple up, um, they still stay on the app for all these other reasons because they have these relations with people on there. Users also use it a lot for travel. Um, but a lot of gay men who might be saying, hey, I'm going to a different city, start talking to people in that city to understand, hey, what can I do? Where should I stay? So our kind of view is Grindr is a gay neighborhood on your mobile phone um, where you have this great, great community of people that are more like you and you can converse with them on about anything you'd like. What's your philosophy in terms of end game for Grindr? Why not join forces with Bumble and become that one-stop shopping for dating? Do you think like that? I'm focused on <laughs> building a really great product for our users um, today and where it can go into the future. What happens kind of on that front, you know, will take care of itself, I think. As long as you d deliver really good value to users, you're creating great shareholder value and great user value, and I think that's what really is important. You know, you, you had one of the trickier kind of uh, events in return to office, and a lot of CEOs are trying to figure out how to go about that the right way, if they even do. What would you, in any advice that you would give towards those leaders and managers? Sure. My view is you have to have a really awesome performance culture for a company to be successful. In Grindr's case, you know, we are going after some really audacious goals. We are serving a user base that historically has been really underserved. That's also under a lot of threat around the world. 60 countries in the world, it's illegal to be gay. We operate in almost all those countries. So like, when we do things, it's for users who really need a lot of support. And so I want us to be working really hard. Um, I want us to be delivering really strong results. And to do that, one of the things you need is to have really good relations with each other. And so having people never see each other for a course of the year, I don't think works. So I think we actually went pretty mild. Two days a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays in the office. By the way, on those days, we serve you breakfast, we serve you lunch, and we give you a stipend to come uh, to, the, to, to pay for transportation to come to the office. So it's actually a pretty like minimal set of requirements. I, we we want to do that because we want to attract really amazing talent to work at Grindr. We are a very lean company. You know, our numbers in terms of employees are very low, and revenue per employee is also really low. So we, we are fortunate we can do those types of things. My view is, so far, I mean, we've only been at it for three months, the results are really positive, especially among engineers. I'm now talking to a lot of candidates who say, I wouldn't have considered this job if you were not back in the office. So a lot of back in the office discussions are around, hey, all the people who are upset about having to come back, but no one's really talking about, it. I think, a much larger cohort of people who want to be back in the office because they want the mentorship, they want the coaching from senior people that they were not getting online, as well as senior people who want to be doing the things they used to do but can't when they're not in the office. And so that's kind of been, I think, missing from the conversation, and all the focus has been on people who don't want to come back to the office, which is a legitimate argument. It's just actually a much smaller percentage than people who want to be in the office. Grinder CEO George Arison joining us here on set alongside Yahoo Finance's Brian Salzi. Thanks so much for taking the time awesome. here with Thank us. Thank you very much. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. We've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Investors looking for bullish strategies have several avenues to reach their end goals. We're digging into those strategies via the options trade in the latest installment of Yahoo Finance's Options 101 Theme Week, sponsored by Tasty Trade. And joining us here to discuss is Jessica Inskip. She is the Options Play Director and Education uh, Product uh, Liaison. And let's just jump into this. We got three different scenarios here. So we're going to take long a stock, and we're talking about risk reward because in trading, you want to have a stop or you want to have some kind of management tool there. And so we're going to take a long stock view, long call option, then long covered call option and compare them. So let's begin with long stock and I'm going to let you set this up. Absolutely. So especially for my beginner options traders who are out there who've never traded before or any type of trader, we have to focus on risk versus reward. So whenever we're buying a stock, the most that we can lose is the most that we spend, right? But when we're trading, we always have a price target in mind. And these are very essential components when we talk about options. We just add that layer of complexity because it's a derivative of more than just the underlying security. Yes. We've got time and implied volatility as well. So in this scenario, we're just assuming this hypothetical long stock is we're buying at the current market price of $100. We have a price target of 110 looking to make $10, which means our break even or the most that we can lose in this scenario is the amount of capital that we spent. Which is all of it, but yeah, yes. Exactly. All right. Now Simple. let's let's get to another scenario here. Uh, uh, long, here we go, long call option. Uh, similar, but uh, break this down, how the call differentiates the risk reward. Absolutely, so same thing. It's important to know that we have a price target in mind. So assuming that we still have that same 110 price target, but now we're buying the call contract for five, that means that we've got actually a, I, oh, I believe this was moved around, I apologize. Yeah. This would be a 105 break even right here is what okay. this is because we would have a higher break even price because there's a cost. I got you. So we it, if we at the current market price is 100, we'll just say we'll we'll correct it right here. Thank you. This is 105. Now we're spending this is a risk reward of, of really, we can only make 50%. That's not very good. This is actually a poor scenario. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest risks of people going into options is they're gonna start by buying calls. And if we're buying this call for five, what you don't realize is that this is $5 from that 100 price mm -hmm. is something you have to overcome before you actually become profitable. And right. that's assuming at expiration, but that's why those other factors are important. And the risk of starting out with options this way, it's important to know how pricing is really comprised. Yeah, and price, so all your premium can go out the window. That's just time decay right there. Absolutely. So let's, instead of buying this option, let's look at another scenario here. Um, and here we have a covered call. And first, we're gonna give you the definition. Investor sells a call option at a set price and expiration date on a stock that the seller owns, that's very important, in an equivalent amount. So I have to own the stock and then I can sell a call above the uh, current price. And here's what that looks like. Yeah, and I see where the issue came up. It's on the previous slide. This one's 97. Got so you. We're gonna I apologize that. for that. But so we'll we'll say this is this one's 97. So here's the difference though. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad we can write it down. Yeah. Now we're receiving that $3 premium. So in comparison to that 100, we've now reduced our risk exposure because we're receiving upfront exactly. So if this line here represents owning the underlying security. Right. Are, have the same substantial loss potential because the most that I can lose is what I can spend. Mm -hmm. I own a stock at this point. I'm selling the covered call, so therefore I'm bullish. I'm utilizing the stock as collateral because I'm obligated to sell my shares at the strike price. In this case, our price target of 110, but I'm reducing my risk right here by $3. Shifting it left, left there. Yes, ever so slightly. Now, with uh -huh. options, there's a give and take. The give, of course, is this premium reduction of $3, the take is capped up towards potential. If I own the stock, I theoretically can hold it indefinitely. It can go up to an unlimited amount. Here, I'm capping my gain potential at 110. All right, so limited upside, and again, we got the potential of 100% loss, but you've put some money in your pocket. Uh, we got about a minute to go here. We got lots of risks and also some rewards. Risks are leverage, complexity, time decay, and option. And I'm gonna give you the floor here in a second. In terms of benefits, we got leverage, hedging, defined risk. What's the message? You got one message you could give options traders starting out. What is it? Never hold an option till expiration. That's the worst thing you can <laughs> I've do. I've done this, by the way. <laughs> it's it's risk. If you are if you hold the option, you lose giving up the time value. Mm -hmm. And then if you 
are short the option, then you actually have what's called gamma risk and you have a huge issue of being unprofitable very quickly. So trade small, trade often, as they say at Tasty Trade. Trade small, trade often. I really love that. Jessica Inskip, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And stay tuned. All your markets action straight ahead. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm senior health reporter Anjali Kimlani. Well, Novo Nordisk out with earnings today with sales strong 36% year over year, driven by the obesity drug Wagovi and diabetes drug Ozempic. The obesity drug causing sales in the U.S. to spike 154% year over year. Here to discuss the full year earnings is Karsten Knussen, the CFO of Novo Nordisk. Carson, thank you so much for joining us today. And I'd love to start out with just breaking down this strong earnings for the year. We're really happy and very proud about the results we, we delivered uh, this morning. Uh, being able to, to grow uh, the company by 36% uh, is historic in our context and in an industrial context in the pharmaceutical industry, growing 36% in an industry grow growing to the tune of 4% is, is also very, very special. And the, uh, the only way that happens is that uh, we've been able to bring products to the market that, that really makes a difference for the patients using uh, these products. And that be it uh, both for Sempic, Vigovi, as well as for Rebelsis, uh, all at GLP-1. So really being able to, to deliver that to the market and uh, enabling us thereby to serve to the tune of 5 million more patients uh, 
as of today compared to a year ago. So really an amazing uh, level of patient reach, uh, which then net net turns into a 36% uh, sales growth and attractive 44% uh, operating profit growth as well. Well, looking at the market, obviously your two drugs, Ozempic and Wagovi, taking the lead there. What can you tell us about Wagovi in particular? I know it's still on the FDA's drug shortage list and you've had to reduce the production of the starter doses. So what can you tell us about the plans for 2024? Well, so, so first and foremost, the, the plans for 2024 tw- uh, are to continue the amazing growth uh, that we saw in, in 23. It's the same growth drivers and, uh, and more or less the same magnitude of growth we're looking into for, for 2024, Ozempic and Vigovi and Rebelsis really being the key growth drivers. More specifically, when we talk about uh, Vigovi, then, uh, then we also just announced this morning that, uh, that uh, uh, earlier this week, we actually started uh, increasing the supply into the US market of the starter doses of Vigovi. So we are, as of this week, uh, more than doubling the amount of starter doses we're supplying the American market. Uh, so, uh, so also stepping up on, on Vigovi in the US and also outside US, you should expect uh, us to roll out in a volume contained manner into more markets uh, in international. So, so we go, we will continue to be a very significant growth contributor to, to the company. And uh, as for Ozempic, uh, uh, pretty much same story. We have a very long runway in terms of uh, getting GLP, GLP-1 out to uh, all the patients who benefit from this type of treatment uh, with Ozempic on a, on a global scale with only to the tune of 6% of patients globally uh, with diabetes using a GLP-1. So a very, very long runway there. And, and, and to accommodate that, then of course, we really need to expand our uh, industrial footprint in terms of our man- manufacturing facilities. And, uh, and therefore, as you saw in 23, we invested 26 billion DKK. It's uh, to the tune of, uh, of some three and a half billion dollar uh, double compared to the year before. And what we're guiding this year is 45 billion kroner in CapEx investments in, in, in 2024. And we hired more than 5,000 people into our manufacturing footprint uh, just uh, the last year. So significant investments into scaling our uh, industrial footprint in order to accommodate uh, the growth opportunity in terms of unmet patient need on a global scale for many years to come. And it's certainly going to be heating up as a competitive market for you this year. You're going to have uh, a competitor directly in competition. That's Eli Lilly with their Zepbound, a little bit less on the price side. What can you tell me about how you plan to compete in this brand new market uh, for the full year? This is a very, very significant size uh, new market. We're talking on a global scale. Uh, about more than 800 million people uh, with obesity uh, that could uh, from uh, from treatment uh, of uh, agents like this. So so this is less about competition head to head in a uh, in a well defined market. This is really about market expansion with more than enough space for for both companies. Definitely. And what can you tell us about this past year and and how it has you know really been such a stellar year for you? One of the reasons why we named Novo Nordisk Company of the Year for 2023. Really, an interesting year and in sort of creating new opportunity for you. What are you looking at when it comes to, especially you? I'm sure you love looking at the uh, the balance book right now. But obviously, investors are looking at you to unload some of it. And where might you be unloading some of that a capital allotment that you now have? Well, for, first of all, uh, thank you so much for, for, for the recognition from Yahoo Finance uh, making us company of the year. We are, this is something we're really proud of. And, uh, and uh, it, uh, to us, this recognition is also about how we run the company and, and the, all the patients we, we serve. And, uh, and I think it's, it's important to note that, uh, that being a successful company in the pharmaceutical industry really, uh, really puts a lot of pressure on the company to, to refresh uh, the R&D pipeline. So, so what we're doing in terms of our all capital allocation is to continue to innovate. So first and foremost, we invest in our business in R&D and, and supply chain, as, as we spoke about before. So, so we are not just enjoying the moment of, uh, of today and the, and the next uh, uh, few years, short, medium term, but we also have uh, an attractive company and, and growth outlook for, for the long term into the 30s and, and 40s. 
So, so really deploying capital into, into R&D and, uh, and, and manufacturing. And, uh, and morning we also announced uh, our dividend uh, payout uh, and, uh, and our full year dividend payout for 2023 is up by 52%. Uh, com compared to the dividend payout for, for 2022. So, so a significant payout to, to shareholder, shareholders also in the form of dividends. And then the last year in terms of uh, capital allocation, really share buyback. And, uh, and we just announced uh, a new share buyback program of 20 billion DKK uh, for, uh, for 2024. And, uh, and this is a notch down uh, or 10 billion down compared to, uh, to 23. And that is really a function of us stepping up, as I mentioned before, our investments in, into CapEx uh, now up to four, 45 billion DKK next year, but, but still share buyback also in 24. Absolutely. And I'm sure investors are happy to hear about the increased dividend for the year. We'll have to leave it there, Carson, but we're certainly going to be watching Novo this year with keen interest as it continues to grow in this space and what you do with that cash on hand. Carson Knudsen, CFO of Novo Nordis. Thank you for having us. Don't go anywhere. Yahoo Finance Live will be right back. We're less than two weeks away from Super Bowl 58, and for the second time in five seasons, the San Francisco 49ers and Kansas City Chiefs will face off in another epic Sunday game where one team will bring home the iconic 
Vince Lombardi Trophy. So who better to talk to than a top executive in the sports industry, 49ers team prepping for the big game. I'm joined now by Al Guido, San Francisco 49ers president and Elevate's chairman and CEO. Great to have you here in studio. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. I mean, my goodness, once again, you've got this matchup and off of a year where we were just looking at some of the numbers that have come in for the playoff viewership, yeah. where we've seen some new highs set here. How do you kind of maintain that momentum from a viewership, a new fan perspective, and make sure that you're capitalizing on that from an organizational seat that you have? I think the NFL has done a fantastic job this year. I mean, you've reported out here on this network, 96 out of the top 100 viewed television games were NFL football games. But we got two good storylines heading into this. We got two historic franchises, obviously the five-time Super Bowl champions. We got Brock Purdy going up against Patrick Mahomes. Uh, I'm sure we're going to talk about Taylor Swift and Travis <laughs> Kelsey and all the other stuff around it. But the NFL has is, is literally never been in a better place as it relates to you know, on-field on talent, off-field viewership, all the pop and circumstance around it. It's going to be a lot of fun in Vegas. Let's talk about that. A Super Bowl in Vegas, uh, the sports betting scene has just been growing so much over the past few years here. What do you think is next from how organizations lean into this, how the NFL leans into this, and, and what does that mean for how you look at the fan experience too? Well, sports betting, as you've reported, I mean, it's been here for a while, and there's no question that that has really garnered, I would say, it started with Yahoo Fantasy, right? And people playing fantasy sports, and that's what got casual fans involved in the NFL. Then sports betting came online. Brad, I would say the next frontier is the international growth. Hmm. I mean, we see what's happening when we're playing games internationally. Now that flag football is a high school women's sport, that it's going to be in the Olympics in LA 2028. It's not just what happens in tackle football, but also what happens in flag. That is leading to tremendous growth, not just here in North America, but abroad. Let's talk about some of the international kind of fandom that is, is certainly growing out, especially in the sports community right now. And you speak of that World Cup. That's coming to you guys at Levi's Stadium. You just re-signed and re-upped with Levi's. I mean, tell us about the significance of that partnership. And, and more particularly, when are we getting the first in-game denim jersey? When are you guys <laughs> going to bring that to us? I'll tell you what. I know Levi's would want it. and I, they're, they're, <laughs> they're thrilled that they got an NFL apparel deal. And uh, Levi's is a fantastic partner of ours. It is unprecedented, Brad, to be extending a deal that still had 10 years in it at record numbers. I mean, we did an increase off the original 20-year, $220 million deal. Now this is a 10-year extension for $170 million. Frankly, these venues have become 365-day assets, right? We've done 155 events in the first years of 10 years of opening Levi's Stadium. We've done $2 billion in economic impact. By the way, 33 for our Taylor Swift concerts this past summer. And 12,000 jobs have been created in those 10 years just in that region because of Levi's. I want to talk about the experience economy outlook, especially as you were mentioning the stadium and the role that that plays as a venue, but also the value that it brings to the local community too. When we think about this consumer environment right now, is this consumer environment showing cracks in services spending? And what's the next big kind of demand generation driver that you anticipate needing to execute, needing to pull that lever in order to retain those consumers? You know, we're not seeing it. On the Elevate side, we represent about 200 properties within sports across the globe. And there's no question certain areas are seeing some softness. Um, but as it relates to call it the marquee brands, the marquee assets, we're not really seeing any softness. I mean, if you look at this Super Bowl, I think it's reported to be on record the most expensive ticket prices out there. If you look what F1's done this past year with the Vegas term, you know, with the Vegas race. But for me, um, I think sports and live entertainment is really capturing a lot of those dollars. So it's probably escaping the ecosystem elsewhere, but not in the sports world right now. At least not we're not seeing it. We'll make this a circular conversation and kind of end where we started at. Uh, and that is the matchup that is coming forth. This is different than, than the 2020 matchup that we saw where now you've got, as you mentioned, Brock Purdy. You've also got Christian McCaffrey. Storylines run abound there. Uh, but Kansas City, they look different, too. They still have Patrick Mahomes, but they've also got Taylor Swift. And, that, and that's an effect that we've seen absolutely be a rising tide for the league. How, how have you been able to quantify that type of effect that Taylor has brought to the NFL for this year and perhaps retaining some of that new fan base? I know it's hard to quantify, but over the course of the last 48 hours, there have been reports that come out that the Kansas City Chiefs have had earned media over $300 million because of her lift. I'll tell you, we, I lean into it. I think it's great for the sport. I have three daughters. They're huge Taylor Swift fans. We got this, as I mentioned, have her in the building. 
and, and you talked a little bit about, we, or at least we talked as I was coming in, about Kristen Juszczyk and yes. make, her making jackets with Kyle Juszczyk playing on our team. Just got a licensing I, deal with I the think NFL. it's great. I mean, there's no question these two teams are going to battle it out in the field. Someone's going to take the Lombardi Trophy home. I hope it's us. Of course, I'm biased. But everything else we should all lean into. This is fun, right? This is an escape from our daily lives. It's what sports is all about, right? The camaraderie, the passion, the storylines, everything going into it. So you know what? As an NFL team, as a president of San Francisco 49ers, let's let, lean in to all this joy that's happening. When you think about the storied organization, the name that is the 49ers, there have been, of course, other teams out there that have looked at how they create an equity structure for season ticket holders. The Green Bay Packers notably have done that. Mm -hmm. Manchester United is publicly traded. Is that something that the 49ers, you ever see the organization thinking about? You know, how do we engage with fans on a vote with your dollars, but also, you know, kind of annex your fandom financially as well here, even more so? It's interesting. I mean, I'm not sure we see it at the San Francisco 49ers, just given where we're at, but I do think that we're headed towards a path. We know in the, in the NBA and other leagues here in North America, they've allowed private equity into those investments. We've seen asset value increases from call it a billion to eight billion, nine billion. Obviously the commanders traded for over six billion. Uh, we'll see in the NFL, there's discussions around whether or not private equity gets let, let into the NFL. It's the last league in North America that does not allow it. I think there was a report yesterday, at least a rumor on the Baltimore Orioles, Brad, but there's no question that if you look at what's happening in the media markets around sports and what the spending looks like, if you're looking at what's happening at the game day and hospitality and merchandise, they're all at really record highs. And truthfully, at least in the NFL, I don't see those things declining. And so the makeup of these ownership groups, I think, will continue to change. We saw what Mark Cuban just did in Dallas. Uh, and so there's just a lot of transactions happening within the sports ecosystem. Al, always a pleasure to get some of your time, your insights. And, of course, big game coming up, no doubt. Uh, you're going to have all eyes, ears to the ground. Uh, hey, I mean, look, we might see you running out there on field. We, we will see Al Guido, San Francisco 49ers president at Elevate, chairman and CEO, joining us here on Yahoo Finance. All right, thanks so much for that interview, Brad, and of course our thanks to Al Guido as well. Well, let's talk a little bit more about Taylor Swift, but is it over now for Taylor Swift, Drake, and Justin Bieber on TikTok? Universal Music Group set to remove all of its artists' music off the social media platform in the coming days. For more on this, Yahoo Finance's reporter Alexandra Canal is here. And Ali, when we talk about the significance of this, a lot of TikTok users are going to be pretty unhappy. Yeah, right now TikTok users can use up to 60 seconds of a song in their videos, but now on the heels of this news, artists like Taylor Swift, Drake, Ariana Grande, Adele, that's no longer going to be available. Now Universal Music Group, it's one of the top music labels in Hollywood, it failed to negotiate a new licensing contract with TikTok. And in an open letter to artists that was released late last night, UMG said that TikTok has been bullying them, has been intimidating intimidating them uh, into accepting a deal that is less than what they wanted, less than what they ultimately deserve, especially when it relates to a few issues like artist compensation along with protections on AI. Now, TikTok said it is, quote, sad and disappointing that UMG has put their own greed above the interests of their songwriters. They said that they've been able to negotiate contracts with other types of labels. Back in July, it did reach a deal with another label, Warner Music Group. Uh, but Right now, it looks like the two sides are at a complete standstill. And like you said, Shauna, those songs are going to be removed in the coming days, which, you know, leading up, you're just talking about the Super Bowl and football, Taylor Swift. No, no Taylor Swift on TikTok. Yeah, at least right now. Uh, what do you think the significance of the, the timing of this is as well with the major events that you were just mentioning, plus other red carpet events that are forthcoming too? Right. Look, TikTok is a huge platform. It is really big for artists, but UMG is arguing that it still accounts for less than 1% of its total revenue due to how little that they pay artists. So they are trying to take a stand. And this reminds me of what we've been really seeing in Hollywood across the board, right? We talk about the SAG after strikes, those actors, writers really fighting on the picket lines for protection surrounding AI. AI and music has been a very sticky touching point in the industry. So it seems like now is a time that Hollywood is really stepping up to the man, so to speak, and trying to make sure that they are not falling behind when it comes to these negotiations. Yeah, certainly. We will see if UMG is successful in maybe uh, forcing some changes into these contracts with TikTok. All right, Ali, thanks so much. Thank you.
Let's take a look at where the market stands right now, about 90 minutes into the trading day. And Brad and I have been talking about it over the last two hours. A lot of the market action this morning, at least, being driven by the two Czech giants that reported after the bell last night. We heard from Alphabet. We heard from Microsoft. A bit of a disappointment, at least from investors' view, in terms of that AI hype, what had already been priced into those stocks ahead of these results. We're seeing that reflected in the movement to the downside here this morning. Brad, we've got the Nasdaq off just about 1.5%. Innovation can be a double-edged sword when there's a lot of expectations riding on it, and that's just what we got coming forward as of right now. But we're going to continue to monitor earnings season. We've got much more, but that's all for us today here. Stay tuned for the top of the 11 a.m. hour. Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufa alongside Akiko Fujita. Here's a look at what we're watching this morning. Alphabet shares falling this morning after missing analyst expectations on ad revenue and Microsoft struggling to meet the street's expectations for AI. Investors hoping for stronger results from its peers, Apple, Amazon and Meta, all set to report after the bell on Thursday. And big tech CEOs heading to Capitol Hill, answering questions about child safety online, what this could mean for future legislation. Plus, investors, of course, setting their sights on comments from Fed Chair Jay Powell this afternoon. The Federal Reserve to announce their latest decision on monetary policy as traders are still split on the timing of that first rate cut. 
But first, let's take a look at where all three majors are trading 90 minutes into the trading day. As you said it, Rochelle, it is about the tech trade, at least early on in the session. The Nasdaq down one and a half percent. We're going to be talking about why in just a bit. But taking a look at where the Dow is up 34, the S&P 500 down 41. And of course, investors also keeping a close watch on that decision expected to come down from the Fed at 2 p.m. Eastern, followed by that press conference from Fed Chair Jay Powell. Let's check in on the Treasury market ahead of that decision. Decision. We have seen some moves there on the longer end as well as the shorter end here. All a pullback. The 10-year yield now at 3.95 percent. The 30-year yield at 4.2 percent. First, though, let's get to the big story of the morning. That is tech earnings, the declines in shares of Microsoft and Alphabet. This coming despite the tech companies delivering a beat on earnings. Investors, though, not necessarily impressed. And Rochelle, you know, don't want to make too much of just one day's move here. You could argue there's some profit taking in there, given the incredible run up that we have seen in both of these stocks. Maybe it's a bit of, you know, sell the news situation. But uh, we've been looking through some analyst notes this morning that seem to suggest sort of where the sentiment is, despite these beats that we saw from the company, specifically on Alphabet. This headline, I think, says it all from Brent Thiel at, over at Jeffrey saying the strong finish is there but investors wanted more. And there's a lot of focus here on ad revenue. Yes, we saw an acceleration there. Not exactly where investors wanted it to be, though. It was up about 13% year on year. YouTube ads up 11% year on year, Rochelle. It's true. And other commentary, see, we keep seeing that word expectations, which makes you wonder how much of this, as we were talking about before, already built in to the share price. And we knew that at some point the rubber was going to meet the road. They were going to want to see those expectations make sense. Looking at Stiefel analyst Mark Kelly, he said these were healthy advertising results, but not enough with the stock reaching all time highs into the print expectations swiftly ticked higher. So it's almost like being a victim of your own success here. And also commentary from Evercore ISI um, in regards to, to Google saying this is fundamentally a stronger quarter as gross revenue search YouTube and cloud and Google other revenues all accelerated. But the price actions following the print reflecting that higher expectations that weren't exceeded. And these were really expectations that the street put on itself here. I mean, some of this was sort of this AI fervor, as you mentioned, some of the profit taking as well. But at some point they had to realize that it wasn't just going to keep riding high. People were actually going to want to see some of these results showing up. Yeah, you could argue there's a bit of head scratching that's coming through here the day after a stock like Microsoft, some would say was priced to perfection. You'd have those like Dan Ives who are saying this is a result that the company should frame because it was so strong. But this headline to me from Guggenheim really says it all good enough. That's the headline coming through from analysts over at Guggenheim saying top line results on key units all beat Wall Street expectations across the board. Yes, Azure came in better than expected, but they saw growth moderating overall. And here's specifically what they said. We wonder how far into the future investors will have to look to get past it. Are we on the cusp of a return to hyper demand or is this simply a new normal? Specifically in Microsoft, Rochelle, you could argue investors are really looking for some additional color on revenue coming through from AI and their product Copilot. Now, having said that, the company didn't report any material gain there on the revenue. It only launched, as in Copilot, only launched one month into the quarter. So that is still to be determined. But you heard Satya Nadella say specifically, we've moved from talking about AI to applying AI at scale. Based on the share move, you could argue investors wanted to hear more about how they're applying and what that means for the revenue picture. That's true. But as we continue to say, and as you mentioned in that context, there's still very early days. So a lot of that overexcitement built in and some of the share price taking a knock because of it. Well, shifting gears here now to something that's happening right here in D.C. Almost every teenager in America is, of course, on social media. According to U.S. Surgeon General advisory released last year, 95 percent of teens aged 12 to 17 are using a social media platform, with more than a third saying they use them almost constantly. Well, now social media CEOs are on Capitol Hill once again, answering questions about child safety online, with Senator Lindsey Graham starting the hearing with some tough words for Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg. Let's Listen. Mr. Zuckerberg, you and the companies before us, I know you don't mean it to be so, but you have blood on your hands. You have a product. You have a product that's killing people. 
So where do social media companies go from here? Well, joining us now on this is Matt Peralt, UNC tech policy professor and former Facebook public policy director. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, so we want to really, of course, set the scene here about what we're covering here, because it's not just about child safety, it's exploitation, it's about predators, it's about data being scraped from, from children aged 13 and under. What is going to be different this time? This isn't Meta's first time in this position. I'm not sure that anything is going to be different. There are companies that have come before Congress numerous times. Every time they've come before companies, the legislators have talked about how now is the time for action. And yet, despite that rhetoric, we really haven't seen much activity, at least at the federal legislative level, over the last couple of years. Uh, Matt, th that's not necessarily a good starting point when you consider this is a hearing that's still going on, right? I mean, you've got all the, the major CEOs testifying here. Um, there is an inherent conflict, it appears, between the model that social media companies have versus the safety aspect of it. Do you agree with that thesis that essentially these algorithms that build these social media companies are built on um, sort of play into these very concerns that lawmakers are trying to address today? So I'm not sure I agree with the framing of the question. There are kids on social media platforms and kids have lots of positive experiences and positive there are positive use cases for kids in social media there are also harms and those harms should be mitigated both by the platforms and by legislators I, it does not seem to me like we have had much activity and we have much hope for future activity from congress we're in an election season in election season congress does does not take significant action typically but what we have seen is a lot of activity at the state level so Last year, there were zero bills, I think, passed in Congress that would regulate the tech sector, zero. But states uh, passed about 65 in areas that are center tracked in a recent report um, on issues like artificial intelligence and privacy, uh, content moderation. Um, and the lead issue actually in 2023 in state legislatures was child safety. Uh, states passed about 23 bills there were across 13 states. And so this was an area of significant activity at the state level. And I think we can anticipate that that will likely happen in 2024 as well. And Matt, we know that uh, a number of different companies, CEOs from X, from TikTok, Snap, Discord, but of course, Meta getting the bulk of the attention because of the uh, being sued by 33 states. So but with that in mind, then, when you don't have sort of any sort of set federal regulations that really cover everything and you have this sort of piecemeal approach from states, how difficult does that make it for something like social media, which is essentially borderless? Well, so I think that's yet to be seen. I mean, first of all, uh, there are 13 states that have passed legislation in this area, but that leaves a large number of states that have not. And so in those other states, there currently are no on the books protections in this area, at least explicitly related to online child safety. Um, and I think you're right to point to the possibility of a patchwork of rules across states. And that's not good, I don't think, for companies that have to deal with lots of different compliance regimes, but it's also not good for users. I live in North Carolina. Um, I have kids in North Carolina. The rights that I have as a parent and the rights that my kids have um, as potential users at some point of social media, I don't think they should change when we drive from North Carolina to Virginia and we cross the border. Matt, you mentioned uh, the, the legislation we've seen at the state level. You know, they range from setting a minimum age for some of these platforms to requiring parental consent. Are there any in particular that you have seen from the state at the state level that, that you think have a lot of muscle in addressing this very issue about child exploitation? So the question about solutions is a really, really hard one. This is an issue, I think, where there is a lot of unity amongst parents and amongst lawmakers, that there is a challenge that we should address in some form. Um, and as a parent, I feel a lot of sympathy with that perspective. I think the question is, how do we do it in a way that is respective of kids' rights to free expression and respective of kids' privacy? And that is really difficult to do in practice. It's extremely difficult. If you just take the baseline issue of how, in order to protect children, we need to know who is a child that's actually really difficult to do in practice. You can do things like require uh, individuals to submit identification, but that then means that social media companies are collecting a lot more data about who their users are, including potentially collecting sensitive data like actual identification. And so even that baseline issue of just figuring out how do I identify who's a kid and who's not is really challenging. And so that's why I don't envy the position that lawmakers are in, where there's just an acute interest in addressing this issue, but the solutions are really, really difficult.
And we did hear a ranking member, Senator Graham, talking about Section 230, which essentially protects social media companies from getting sued from some of the content that users post online. Now, that came out in 1996, when about 40 million people were using the internet, currently looking at about 5 billion people online. So in terms of the progression of how some of these social media companies have evolved, is perhaps revoking or adjusting Section 230 the way to do it? Because we are seeing this unwillingness to really self-regulate in a way that's making a meaningful difference, especially when it comes to, to the mental health of children. Yeah, so I think Section 230 is actually really important here in providing some of the protections that I think lawmakers want. I mean, first of all, it protects uh, individual, it, it, it makes it less likely that social media companies will censor users, and that's an issue that's really important to conservatives. And it also really makes explicit that social media companies have the ability to moderate content on their platform, and that's an issue that's particularly uh, of interest to Democrats who want to make sure that tech companies take action uh, to address harmful content. So I think social media, uh, I think Section 230 is likely more part of the solution than part of the problem. Um, our center at UNC uh, has partnered with Lawfare and Slate to publish a list of all the 230 proposals that have been introduced in Congress over the last couple of years. And so if anybody wants to check that out, they can go to that website just to see the catalog of different approaches that lawmakers have used. I think the thing that is a little bit challenging in discussions in this area is that law lawmakers beat the drum on this, but they don't actually take action. And again, we're in an election year, so I don't think that's likely, we're likely to see much action um, in the coming months. Finally, Matt, um, a question that, that may be a bit cynical here, but mm. when you look at a company like Meta, uh, a publicly traded company, profits haven't necessarily taken a hit as a result of all these concerns that have been raised. Shareholders aren't necessarily responding to what's these re the research and studies that have come out. Um, uh, at what point does this, as in the concerns around harms on users, at what point does that become a business concern for a company like Meta? Or is it already, even though that's not necessarily reflected in their financials? Well, I, I think that has actually been reflected in some companies' uh, financials. I mean, Meta's stock price is up right now, but it went through a long period of a slumping stock price in the, way, in the wake of the Francis Haugen disclosures related to a, a whole bunch of different issues, but I think including that one. Um, we certainly have seen X face significant challenges when there's been the perception that they've underinvested in trust and safety, and that has resulted, some allege, in advertiser flight away from that platform. So I do think that we actually have seen companies perceive this as a as a business issue. I, I also think it's important to recognize that um, it's not just Mark Zuckerberg who is testifying today, even though he's the, the person on the screen right now. It's a range of different platforms. And those platforms also have an interest in having strong experiences for kids online, which, which I think means including kids in those online experiences, not censoring them entirely or preventing them from having access to social media platforms that people of other ages have. But also, I think there is a responsibility to protect them, but hopefully to do it in a way that allows for a diverse set of companies. And so there are companies um, <clears throat> who are testifying today that haven't testified before, um, like Discord and Snap, for instance, um, or at least their CEOs haven't testified. And I think it's important to hear from them as well about the range of things that they do to protect kids online. And then also the unique experiences they have with dealing with some of these compliance challenges. It's typically the case, typically the case that smaller companies actually can devote fewer resources to complying with a whole patchwork of different rules across state lines. And so their voice here, I think, is important for thinking about solutions that will work, not just for the metas of the world, but also for the smaller platforms. And Matt, obviously, a lot of headlines were made when um, distorted and deep faked images of Taylor Swift were circulating all over X. It did take a while for those images to come down, but it does speak to this issue of if someone as big as Taylor Swift, it can take you know, a machine of her fan base to get some content moderators to pay attention. If you're an average person, as, as uh, Lindsey Graham was saying at the beginning, having some of these compromising images online, what can people do to protect themselves as some of these issues, of, um, some of these protections are not built in. You have to opt into them, especially if you're a young person. This is a really difficult set of issues, and I think people face a range of challenges in the relationship they have with tech companies. I do think it's important that they understand the settings that are available to them. I think your point is spot on. That can be really hard to do. Um, it can be complicated. It can be in the weeds of various different companies' uh, settings offerings. But I do think it's important for people to figure out the settings that work best for them and the usage that works best for them and that, that gives them a positive 
experience. I think that's the kind of thing that we need to educate people about and to promote good specific tactics for digital citizenship and digital health. Always appreciate your perspective there. Uh, Matt Peral, UNC tech policy professor and former Facebook public policy director. Thanks so much. Thank you. All your market, and action, market action straight ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Well, the FOMC out with its policy decision this afternoon. No change expected in interest rates this time around, but investors will be listening for any signal about a potential rate cut when Fed Chair Jerome Powell takes the podium at 2.30 p.m. Eastern today. 60% of traders are expecting the first rate cut at March, the March meeting, according to the CME Fed Watch tool. Let's bring in Cindy Bellew, conning uh, North America CIO, to discuss more. Uh, Cindy, good to talk to you today. What specifically are you hoping to hear from the Fed chair today at that press conference this afternoon. Great to speak with you as well. And you know, I think as we're looking at the Fed's uh, speech today following their meeting, their two-day meeting, we expect it to be really neutral. I think we saw Powell turn to a more dovish stance when he took the podium in December of last year, and that really sent markets flying pretty quickly um, and maybe some lessons learned from that. But also the reality is the evidence isn't quite there yet for them to be as definitive about when to start cutting rates. We expect that they will try to absorb 
absorb some of the first quarter data, which they really haven't had the opportunity to see much of yet. We don't have a reading on January jobs that will come at the end of this week. We know there are CPI revisions that are coming. That's important as well. And he does have the benefit of the Humphrey Hawkins testimony, which will be done in either late February or early March before that next Fed meeting. And so maybe we'll get a little more insight from the Fed over the next couple of months. But we expect today to be no change in rates and really try to stay pretty quiet on what they're planning to do as far as changing the trajectory of the balance sheet reduction. So, Cindy, what do you think is going to be the key theme? Since we're not expecting a rate cut, what do you expect Fed Chair Powell to hone in on? So we think it's going to be, you know, this, this battle between inflation and the labor markets. Everybody is getting pretty comfortable with the idea that inflation is slowly moving towards the Fed's target and consistently going to get there. We're not quite on the same page with that. We're watching monthly inflation prints of 0.2 or 0.3%. And as you annualize those, that doesn't get us to the Fed's 2% target. So we're not quite as comfortable, but the market is certainly pretty confident that inflation is well in check. So what's the other part of the Fed's mandate, the labor markets? And we are wondering today if Chair Powell will give in a little bit to the questions he got asked last time and probably again today, which is more important. If inflation is truly in check and if the Fed Chair Powell is willing to say that the labor markets are more important, that means the Fed is getting more comfortable on inflation. And so it does turn the attention fully on the labor markets, which is what we've been focused on for quite some time. With, we, with strong, tight labor markets, the consumer will continue to feel good about spending. And that may create some challenges for some of those stubborn, sticky portions of inflation. So it makes the uh, the question about when they start easing a little bit less obvious to us. But if they show a signal that they feel good about inflation, markets will perceive that as March is the first cut and there will be a series of them from there. So, Cindy, let's look ahead to Friday. Obviously, that big jobs number coming through. If that headline number comes in stronger than expected, and you you sort of look at all of the data we've gotten on inflation so far. In your mind, does that make March a live meeting? I mean, how do you think about that in the context of all the other economic data that's come through? Sure, it's you know it's certainly a, a murky picture um, when you try to put it all together. But one of the things we're looking at with the labor markets is, you know, we've heard from the Fed looking for unemployment to break above 4%, and we've been challenged to do that. The expectations for a slight uptick to 3.8. If we do see that rise in unemployment, that should get the attention of the Fed, and it does bring that March meeting maybe a bit more into focus for that first cut. If, however, you know, we see that continued strength in the labor markets and the unemployment rate stays in check, and importantly as well, what we see for wage inflation. We got the employment cost index today, and it was better than expected at 0.9%. Expectations were 1%. But the number for the full year was 4.2%. And when you look at where inflation sits today, that means we had real wage growth for 2023. So those wage data uh, points for the employment report on Friday will be equally important because that will inform the Fed about how the consumer will feel going forward. So, you know, strengthen that employment report would suggest that the Fed probably can stay on hold longer. Weakness in that employment report may bring forward that first rate cut to March. And Cindy, even as we look at some of the Fed speak leading up to this meeting, a lot of the Fed governors seeming very comfortable to stay in this holding pattern, not really seeing an impetus to change as they're not seeing a consistent decline, especially in some of the, the, core, the core inflation there. What are some of the questions that investors have about really how to navigate this time then? I think the question that in investors mostly have is, what are you waiting to see break um, if you're willing to hold rates at these levels? We're in the camp that they should hold rates higher for longer. Um, inflation, if they're true about their 2% target, We're not there yet. And as you just mentioned, the monthly data doesn't support us getting there anytime quickly. So we see the higher for longer, but the markets are fighting that. And they're trying to figure out what is it going to take for the Fed to see to actually break before they're willing to really admit they need to start cutting rates and they need to do it even more aggressively than what their dot plots are suggesting. And there's a huge gap between those two things right now. You know, We're back to five or six rate cuts by the markets and only three by the Fed. That has to sort itself out over the course of this year, too. So I I think that's another big piece of it. And when will the Fed feel confident enough that they can start pulling, you know, or leaving the liquidity situation the same in the markets? In other words, getting back to their balance sheet. What are they going to do with that? And I think that's a big lingering question for today as well. 
Well, certainly I know uh, markets will be looking for any sort of dovish tone they can expect from the Fed. I'm sure he will keep it, keep it steady, though, in that announcement. Appreciate you joining us this morning. Cindy Bolio, Conning North America's CIO. Thank you so much. All right, we're looking at Starbucks sales getting hit by slowing consumer demand and inflation. But China is leaving investors particularly worried, even with the beverage company's push into smaller cities. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Brooke De Palma to discuss more. Hey, Brooke. Good morning, Rochelle. Certainly, Starbucks results here didn't exactly alleviate Wall Street's concerns over its future growth plans in China. Same store sales did come in less than expe- lower than expected, jumping 10 percent this past quarter in China, falling short of the 16 percent jump that Wall Street expected. And that was largely driven by a couple of key factors. That slower sales of higher priced merchandise, in addition to a more cautious consumer that they're seeing in China. Now, despite all that foot traffic, Traffic did jump 21 percent, but that was largely due to a lapse in COVID-19 restrictions that happened last year. Check size, as you can see right there, dropped 9 percent. And this comes as local brands like Luckin Coffee and Koti Coffee are really coming in with pretty aggressive pricing strategies, particularly low price strategies. But despite those low price competitors, Starbucks does plan to stay the course of this strategy. Starbucks CFO Rachel Jerry telling us more on that this morning. We continue to focus on being premium, and that means a premium experience. And we have distinct and competitive advantages to drive that, including a very locally relevant coffee forward innovation strategy with our beverages and our food. We saw some good success with that in this quarter and we'll continue that. But we expect that over time, you're going to start to see the per capita coffee consumption increase, which is a good thing and we'll benefit from that. And on the call last night, Starbucks China co-CEO Belinda Wong made it very clear that there is a promotional environment that they're seeing in China, but they are not interested in entering a price war there. And they once again, they do plan to stay the course as a premium player. They do plan to grow rapidly to 9,000 stores in China by the year of 2025. But, however, important to note here that they did lower their fiscal 2024 guidance, particularly for sales growth. And in China, they now expect same-source sales growth to grow low single digits, and that's down from roughly 4 to 6 percent range that they had previously anticipated. So, Brooke, I mean, stay the course, no real promotions, and yet you're talking about the competition from the likes of Luckin. How does Starbucks differentiate itself? Or are, are they starting to see some of their strategy in China really take hold? Yeah, Kiko, they're really doubling down, saying that they believe that as time goes on, they're growing to grow that coffee consumption among Chinese consumers. But they're sticking to that premium strategy, really trying to engage Chinese consumers there as they really grow and make that aggressive growth strategy there. One thing that they're doing is making a significant investment in technology. They now know from being there in, and growing rapidly in recent years that these consumers tend to engage more on digital. We now know that digital channels account counted for a record 52 percent of sales there. So they aim to inject uh rather invest in technology there. Other ways they plan to do it, a bit untraditional maybe for this market, is increase engagement in social media, rather traditional, uh, with influencers and partnerships. And interestingly enough, a lot of these low price competitors, well, they aim to go to markets where they are. They say that they're increasing the percentage of new stores opening in low, lower tier markets and new county cities. So really trying to target places they haven't been before maybe, and really trying to understand the consumer more as they continue to stay the course, look to grow there, but they're not necessarily seeing the results that they may have expected. We'll continue to track that. Appreciate you as always, our very own Brooke De Palma. All right, all your markets action still ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. with a Fed decision high on expectations despite zero chance of any actual move on rates. The central bank is likely to hold its benchmark rate steady at a 22-year high of 5.25% to for the fourth straight meeting. Here's what you need to know. Number one, the economic backdrop. The Fed's first meeting of 2024 comes at a time of economic expansion. It may be backwards looking, but 3.3% GDP growth in the fourth quarter has us asking yet again, what recession? Then there's inflation. We know it's finally heading back down toward that much sought after 2% level. Sounds like the perfect recipe for cuts, but is it? Number two, March is the word. 
Investors have put the second meeting of 2024 on the table for the first rate cut. But will the Fed nod in that direction? The Cleveland Fed's Loretta Mester says that's probably too early. Fed Governor Christopher Waller seems to agree, this month effectively saying fools rush in and cuts should be implemented methodically and carefully. Then there's Austin Goolsby of the Chicago Fed. He needs to see more data. Number three, the balance sheet. It may not be the most exciting part of the Fed's activities, but it does have potentially serious implications for investors. At the start of the pandemic, the Fed started boosting its balance sheet in part through buying lots of treasuries. That's known as quantitative easing. The reversal of that process, known as QT or quantitative tightening, started in 2022. Now the future of that policy is increasingly becoming a talking point for investors. We'll be across all the action and at the critical meeting for the Fed right here on Yahoo Finance. Don't miss it. Well, the Nasdaq down about one and a half percent here uh, with tech shares continuing to come under pressure. This comes after Microsoft and Alphabet reported earnings both beat overall earnings estimates, but did not beat investors lofty outlook expectations, it seems, sending overall tech stocks lower. For more on how you can diversify your portfolio with MAG7 exposed ETFs 
As part of our ETF report brought to you by Invesco QQQ. Let's bring in Cynthia Murphy, ETF Think Tank Director of Research here. Uh, Cynthia, the MAG7 has certainly been a very popular trade when you think about ETFs. What have the fund flows been like as we continue to get these quarterly results from the big names? Yeah, Kiko, it's, it's been like in the last year or so, it, investors can't get enough of the MAG7, as you well know. Uh, a lot of money has gone into everything from your big classic tech funds, uh, your QQQs of the world, and, and into like more the AI focused type of strategies. Uh, it's been like anywhere you find some of these names, your NVIDIA's, your AMD, your, your Microsoft's, Apple's, the money has gone there. Uh, so far in 2024, we're starting to see a little bit of a pause there, a little bit of a hesitation because there feels like there's a little bit of uncertainty on what this looks like going forward. But uh, appetite has been strong for, for these names, as you know, across ETFs, across just the stock market directly, uh, anywhere they can get their hands on them. So, Cynthia, as we hone in on AI, I mean, you have some of these that are pure tech ETF plays. You have some that are more sort of AI as a theme, but include different pockets of things. And then you have some of these companies that are almost planning on using AI as a co-pilot to fuel their, their business growth. What are some of the ones that you like as you dig down into some of these different segments? It's, what's interesting about the AI space is it says there's so many ways to tackle it. Uh, AI as an investment theme, like you actually want to capture that AI uh, innovation, the disruption. Uh, these AI funds come in many different flavors. Some some are all robotics. Some are you know broader takes, and and you can slice and dice this in different ways. What's been interesting is is that since ChatGPT came out, you know about a year ago or so, all that hype, all that enthusiasm over uh, the innovation in the space has really kind of cooled down. It's like we've gone from from the hype to like growing pains, a little bit of maturity sinking in. And but from an investment perspective in the ETFs, what has really worked well is concentration. So the more MAG7 you have in your AI portfolio, the better you've done. Uh, going forward, that may or may not be the case. Most market strategists are calling for diversification, you know, be wary of too much AI exposure. So, you know. As an investor, what you really have to do is take a look at what does that, that portfolio looks like. So, you know, one of the classic AI battles is between funds like Robo versus Bots, which were the two first robotics focused ETFs. And they're a classic example of this because with Bots, NVIDIA is like the biggest holding. It, it, it represents so much of that portfolio exposure. Where Robo is much more diversified, tilts much more, you know, lower, smaller cap. So it hasn't performed as well, but going forward, if diver diversification becomes the way to go about this, you ought to, you know, look out for those kinds of things. How much are you concentrated on the top names? So these are the ways you, to think about this space as you, as you look to invest. Is that what you're advising clients, Cynthia, to not necessarily throw all your eggs in one basket, but if you are going to invest in AI broadly, maybe to diversify a little? This is what we're hearing from, from people that we've been talking to. It is the call for diversification. Now, it's really tough to embark on diversification when you've seen the, the kind of performance MAG7 has delivered. You know, it's easy to want to bet on the winners big time. But, uh, you know, everyone we've been talking to this year is really cautious. We don't know what the Fed's going to say. We don't know what the environment is going to be for growth names. Uh, there's a lot of call for slow down on growth. Let's go into more cyclical sectors. You know, this is if you look at forward PE earnings, these companies are so overvalued relative to the rest of the market. Uh, so, you know, is there a period of consolidation coming? All of these things are suggesting you know, watch out for diversification. Make sure your portfolio is not heavily tilted just towards two or three names. Uh, it's all about risk management at the end of the day. And speaking of risk management, have to talk about spot Bitcoin ETFs. So now we have just obviously still early days, but at least some sense of some of the flows here that we're seeing. We're seeing great, great scale um, Bitcoin trust, seeing net app flows, net net outflows of about $5 billion. Recipients, though, really benefiting from this, BlackRock and Fidelity. What are we seeing as this is becoming slightly more mature, even though it is still early days here? 
Yeah, it's been it's been a busy two weeks for these ETFs. Uh, I think no one is too surprised to see the outflows from GBTC. Uh, you know, if you remember, that was a private trust before it converted into an ETF. So all that money was locked in there. And this is the first opportunity these investors have to really get out. And, you know, GBTC costs three, four or five times as much as some of the other ETFs. So as an investor, as we've seen some of that money get out, they, you know, they lock in their profits and they, they may go to cheaper funds. We can't really relate one to one here. But, uh, you know, the ETFs that came out other than GBTC, they're so low cost. The, the access points are very low and, and easy entry. So we're starting to see uh, money flow. The good news is outside of GBTC, all nine ETFs have seen positive inflows. So demand is there. Uh, we also are starting to see who's emerging as category leaders. And maybe to no one's surprise, you know, companies like iShares, Fidelity, the big box shops, are leading the race here. But there's also interesting, you know, momentum behind the more what we call the crypto natives, funds like Bitwise and um, ARK even is, is getting some strong flows here. So it's a space where so far everyone is doing well outside of GBTC, and, uh, but maybe hasn't been the blockbuster. We haven't seen $100 billion go into these funds in two weeks. So I think, uh, you know, sentiment is a little more tempered and, uh, we're waiting to see what when does GBTC stop leading and, and how things settle down. We'll certainly keep a track of that, especially as you wait the Bitcoin halving, of course, coming up in April as well. A big thank you there to Cynthia Murphy, ETF Think Tank Director of Research, for joining us this morning. Thanks so much. All right, coming up, shares of pharmaceutical company Teva are rising today after reporting better than expected results. We have the CEO Richard Francis with us on the other side of this break. Teva shares popping after reporting better than expected results in its fourth quarter, seeing $4.5 billion in revenue and $1 in adjusted earnings per share. Joining us now to dive into these earnings is Richard Francis, Teva's CEO, and of course, our very own health reporter, Anjali Kamlani. Uh, thank you both for joining us uh, this morning. So really seeing uh, Teva stock being rewarded here after that beat on the top and bottom line. Some investors honing in on concerns about the profit outlook. But overall, what do you think was really behind what you saw in the fourth quarter, Richard? Well, firstly, thank you for having me on. Um, yeah, it was a good quarter and it was a good year for Teva. Just to remind people, 
uh, this is Teva's first year of growth for many years. And, and this is the culmination of a lot of hard work, particularly we launched a strategy last year, a pivot to growth strategy, where we've been executing across four pillars. And as we've executed, we've, we've continued to improve results. And the primary reason for this is we've been doubling down on our innovative portfolio, uh, primarily a product called Estedo and Ajovi. And Estedo uh, grew at 28% and Ajovi at 18. And they really helped drive our, our revenue growth. And our generics business has returned to growth as well. So two major parts of our business have grown, and that's allowed us to actually put in these results um, and, and achieve that growth. And it's something we want to continue to do in 2024. Richard Angeli here. I know that you know the company is having somewhat of a comeback, if you will. There was a lot of excitement even at JPM over the presentation for the company. Talk to me about that and sort of what you see as the true growth strategy and path for the company. Well, well, thank you, and thank you for recognizing that. I think uh, obviously, you know, there's been some ch challenges in the past, for Teva, But when I came in, I saw some fundamentals, which when you look at them could really allow us to drive a successful company, drive the top line and the bottom line. And you know, when we looked at it, there were a few things this company had, which I think were underappreciated. One is that portfolio I've just mentioned, Estedo and Ajovi, which we've invested more resources in. And because of that, we've grown the revenue significantly. The second thing is our pipeline. Uh, we've actually accelerated that through the clinic and we'll be having some readouts later this year on olanzapine, our long-acting treatment for schizophrenia. We accelerated that six months. So that'll be coming earlier for a readout. And that's exciting because if that hits its target product profile, then that could be quite transformational for patients who want a long-acting form of olanzapine. So we moved the innovative pipeline through. And then on the generics business, we actually looked at the fundamentals and thought we have some good stuff here, we just need to execute it better. And quarter on quarter, we started to execute better. So when you ask me about you know, what the short and long term is from a growth, we've returned to growth, we will accelerate that growth in 25 to 27, and then we will maintain it going forward. And we have clear plans to do that. So I think we've been rewarded for giving a clear plan and then executing on that plan and our job is to keep executing on it. And I think that will build more credibility and more support for the company. I hear you on that growth and, and I can see it. I know there's the moves that you've been making and you're, you're coming back and pulling the company back from the opioid saga as well as price fixing concerns. So with that in the rear view and with that in mind, uh, we did get uh, JPM analysts saying, quote, sentiment has clearly become more positive on shares. However, the, with a relative lack of growth in the portfolio in the near term, we do not see a compelling risk reward in shares from here. What would you say to that, considering all the stuff that you're focused on and what you have to contend with, they're really looking for sort of, you know, clearly an anchor, sort of a blockbuster in, in the in the in the near term. Yeah, look, I think um, what I would say is, I think you can get some sentiment like that because the, of the past still. And, and I think you said it's in our rear view, view mirror. And I think it actually is. But I think that probably lingers in some people's minds. What I would say, the anchor for growth. So I talked about Estedo. Estedo did 1.2 billion in 23. We've given guidance for 1.5 billion in 24. And we've said it's going to do 2.5 billion by 27. So we're very clear about what products are going to achieve what. So I do think we have clarity on where the revenue is coming from and where the profitability will come from as well. I think what's probably uh, at the back of the odd person's mind is, can they keep doing it? And in a way, I understand that. You know, our recent past has been a bit challenging, so we've had a good 23. What we need to do is make sure make sure we execute on a 24. And then I think some of that reticence will turn to positivity, and people will see the fundamentals of this strategy are good, the fundamentals of our innovative portfolio are good, and as we keep posting improvements in the profitability, improvements in the top line, then I think that's where we'll garner even more support. But it, it is down to us to execute and to continue to execute. Um, so I think that's the way I read it. How much of an overhang is the opioid settlements for you right now? And also, you know, pivoting away from the API business in a world where we see pressures from IRA, from the FTC. Explain that logic to me. Yes, no, I, look, I think when I came in and we did the pivot to growth strategy, we looked across all of the, the businesses at Teva and understood, you know, where do we want to grow? And we clearly want to grow our innovative business and our generics business. 
And as we think about other areas of our business, which are world-class and very good in the API business, Tappy API is the second largest API manufacturer in the world. It is world-class. But two things we, 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 we did, we saw when we analyzed it, which is one, it's constrained being part of, of Teva. The global API market is an $85 billion market. And that business was set up to serve predominantly us as Teva, a vertically integrated part, and less to serve the external market. We think the TAPI to really flourish, it should be out there uh, addressing the external demand and the external market of 85 billion. For us in Teva, as we think about the strategy, it comes down to capital allocation. And for us, it's about being really focused on capital allocation. Because of that, in releasing TAPI to grow externally, we also free up capital to invest in the business to ensure that we can grow our innovative business, bring our innovative pipeline forward and grow our generics business, which we believe will top, grow top and bottom line with that singular focus. Well, certainly looking at the share price sitting at a 52 week high, seeing that investors sharing some of that optimism as well. I appreciate you taking the time to join us. Richard Francis, Teva CEO and Anjali Kemlani. Thank you both. Thank you very much. All right, all your markets action still ahead. Stay tuned, you're watching Yahoo Finance. There's another potential buyer joining the list to acquire Paramount. Shares of Paramount moving to the upside. Up more than 8% there after media mogul Byron Allen made a $14.3 billion bid to buy all of Paramount's outstanding shares. That's according to Bloomberg. Let's bring in our very own Ali Canal, who has the details here. Um, Ali, there's a number of quarters, right, suitors, we should say, uh, for Paramount. Uh, what could potentially put Byron Allen in a better standing here for approval. Well, Akika, what's interesting about Byron Allen's deal is it seems like he wants to maintain those linear networks. And that's been a big question here when it comes to any type of potential sale. Who would ultimately want to buy a dying linear network business? I mean, you've seen cord cutting escalate across the board. You've also seen advertising come in really weak for those linear networks. But Byron Allen has a lot of experience with these types of assets. His company, Allen Media Group, owns 10 cable networks, including the Weather Channel. 
The company also owns broadcast stations across the country. It's currently in 21 markets with 28 big four broadcast networks. The big four networks there being ABC, CBS, Fox, and NBC. So that's really key here because the report says that uh, Byron would maintain those linear networks, but he would sell off the studios and the film side of the business. And the film side has been really attractive and likely will continue to be of interest to a lot of those other buyers out there. We know that Paramount has produced some top programming, some top movies like the Mission Impossible franchise, along with Top Gun Maverick, Paw Patrol, Smile. So there would be a lot of interest there. Now, one thing that is a bit unclear is how Byron Allen would ultimately finance this deal. Moffat Nathanson saying the fact that that is unclear has casted some doubt and some shadows over the credibility of this offer. But others on Wall Street are a bit more optimistic. Wells Fargo analyst Steve Keyhall said that the fact that he does want to sell the studio business, that he does want to sell some of that real estate, including the lot uh, at Paramount, that that would ultimately finance any potential deal. So we'll see if something comes to fruition. Certainly, this one seems like it could happen. But again, Shari Redstone, who is the president of National Amusements, that's the holding company that controls Paramount Global, she seems hesitant to want to do something. We know she's been exploring talks, exploring deals, but she really wants that mm. high premium. She thinks Paramount is worth a heck of a lot of money. So we'll see. There's been a lot of suitors out there. Maybe we'll have a bidding war down the line. It's true. And this isn't Byron Allen's first time trying to get a piece of Paramount. He tried before um, with BET Media Group as well. Um, what do you think would be the sticking point? We know that the, the CBS part of it in terms of the broadcasting rights being so lucrative for sports, likely off the table. Who do you think is in the best position when we think about some of the other suitors? Well, this certainly is attractive considering it's an all-cash deal for all of the business. And this would also benefit those Class B shareholders, those shareholders that don't have voting power. So, you know, KeyBank said that this is an attractive deal that Paramount should really jump at, especially considering the premium that they'd be getting at. I mean, the stock is up today, but it still is not trading at the level that Byron Allen would be willing to pay for it. According to Bloomberg, he offered $20.58 each for the company voting shares, again, that 50% premium compared to current trading levels. And then for those non-voting shares, $21.53 there. You're seeing shares trading just under 15 bucks a share right now. So we'll see. I think it's all going to come down to price. We will watch this space. Appreciate you breaking that down for us, our very own Ali Canal. Well, that does it for now. I'm Rochelle Akufo alongside Akiko Fujita. Thanks for watching Yahoo Finance. Stay with us.